Amen. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Adam Lore. I'll be right back. All right, we're live. For those watching the rerun, we'd like to welcome you to picture show number 42 with Jim Egan and Tracy Twyman about John D. and the fabulous uh, Freeport Tower. Hey, there's six people here. Welcome to the show. It's Zach Lombie, looks like he's in there. So did you have to go to church to get that thing? Me? Yeah. That thing. What thing? The X on your head. <laughs> oh, no, I think I just, I think I just got something on my forehead there. Sorry about that. <laughs> What are you guys giving up for Lynn? It's a secret. <laughs> How about you? I think we're, well, I feel like we're giving up our uh, three hour sound check here. <laughs> we're starting on time. Weird. So, it's like a big new beginning. We're giving we're up fine. slack. We can't give up slack for Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the good Catholic and what did you give up for Lent? Ah. 
<laughs> I'm remain reserved and not say anything about giving things up. Yes, that was Jim's design, and um, if we're going to publish them, we definitely want to uh, to hone that up a little bit. But the uh, the key to all art is when you get the idea, do something right now, or you'll lose it forever. Kirk Vonnegut said, "Easy come, easy go." <laughs> I see that, yeah. We're glad that you're here, Zach. It's been a while. Zach was one of our earliest consistent fans and a staunch promoter of the show. Uh, folks, if you're bored on Saturday mornings, Zach was doing a weekend morning, like Saturday morning coffee with just a little tiny splash of whiskey, reviewing the news, talking about eccentric and interesting things. So, I don't know if they're still doing it or not, but even if they're not, watching the reruns is fun. Hey, it's Ryan Martin. Thumbs up to you too, Ryan. Yeah, we got Adam Lore vinyl in Potentia, t-shirts in Potentia, Tracy's entire catalog of past published material in Potentia. We got a lot of potential folks. That's if you're overlooking the exclusive, expensive, paid private hangouts at $111 a pop per person. I, yeah. And, uh, and, and life coach sessions, of course, also. Yeah, 555. Five, five. <laughs> that's, the, that's the number. If you, if you want us to make your life better for you and tell you what you're doing wrong. <laughs> First buy Tracy's tapping book and then pay $555 to sbaldrahotmail.com. We will improve you. Hey, I'm playing bass on this track. A pretty famous band called Holt's Claw um, asked Adam Lore to uh, write some music for some lyrics that they had. And Adam and I actually recorded this at Ryan Martin's dad's house, believe it or not. They're, they're down in L.A. It felt like a really big deal at the time. Um, the lyrics are uh, all about, it's called Doddling on the Boardwalk with my dad's best friend and uh the lyrics are all about it sounds like whoever wrote it i think it's travis these guys used to do uh red state update if you ever saw that it's the same guys red state update was like a conservative spoof or a liberal spoof on like backwoods hillbilly conservatives like they both dress up like you know all american flags and talk like hicks but um it's funny if you've never seen a red state update but um I think the, the main the main singer, Travis, his last name slipped in my mind. Um, I'm pretty sure he wrote the song, and I think it's uh, based on a real life experience. Like, like he had to go down to the boardwalk with his dad's best friend and like laying on a towel and reading a book and seeing the people playing volleyball and all that kind of stuff. Channel says he's ready to be waterboarded in the spirit of truth while Flashdance plays. <laughs> Who says this? Adventure Channel? Channel? I'm ready to be waterboarded in the spirit of truth while Flashdance plays with my favorite inner friends <laughs> here at RX Picture Show. Well, we... <laughs> Maybe we have to add things to the in potential list, huh? 
Adventure Channel's been doing a lot of uh, great shout-outs on, on Twitter and uh, even making graphics, one of which I used on my website. I agree, and I saw that. Yeah, we, we, we always double shout-out back to the Adventurer Channel because he's, he's, in this, he's a kindred spirit, same vein, same stuff, man. We find each other. It's God's will. <laughs> Not Crowley's will. Dumb. <laughs> That's a lot of times. or anything so I don't know why you would say you thought we were lovers just yanking our chain trying to you know you're in the wrong chat to be trying to get anybody's goat buddy we know about goats around here we got our own goats <laughs> you think Adam Moore will write a song about Walmart bathroom <laughs> well I mean it, it, He's not a predictable person, but I mean, if you want to encourage Adam Lord to write a song about Walmart Baphomet, then you either have to like flatter him with how great he really is, or offer him money or both, and he'll do it. I mean, if you say, hey, we've got 200 bucks, we need a, a nice, at least three or four minute song about Baphomet, even if he doesn't want to, he'll still do it, just because it's worth it, you know? So I think that well maybe I know they've got America's Got Talent, which is different. But uh, have you seen the the, the masked singer stuff? I have not. You know, yeah. but I've only seen the previews. But gee, Whizzikers. So they're, they're wearing masks. Yeah, they're wearing like furry suits, like a whole huge mask, like like Mickey Mouse or. Or whatever you know, like, and they they must have it mic'd up from the inside, and it's a famous person in the suit, and so the audience or the contestants have to guess who's singing, and it's it's occulty and weird, like it's really 
it's dark and symbolic. Like you, you, Tracy, it wouldn't take you two seconds. You'd see just the flash of the screen and go, oh, what the hell? Because <laughs> it's full of occulted symbolism and weird. It's not, it's not subtle. The, the stage lighting is super dark and like reds and purples. Yeah, Mercury's totally in Gatorade. I hate when Mercury's in Gatorade. Yeah. Maybe that's why things are working relatively well for us right now. Yeah, my my uh, my Scorpio soul seems to go pretty good. Everyone's like, Mercury's in retrograde. And I'm like, I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's going backwards? Good. <laughs> Are you, I'm, not, I'm not watching the playback, so keep us on the heads up. 24 people waiting. Thank you very much. We got about five minutes, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna text our special guest, who's actually in his museum and waiting to show us things. gonna get really confusing i guess just call me jim from here on out tonight jim yeah well i usually do call you jim jim mario pay is adam more not seeing this i gotta find out adam lord if you're in the chat please answer this question are you singing what's playing right now thank you is it his song no it's a different guy's song oh is he friends with that guy? Yeah. Wow. Hey, Jacob, have you thought about what? Is it possible that maybe they're lying to us about when Mercury goes into Gatorade? Some of the luminary research we've done kind of suggests that maybe the equinoxes are actually, the, the solstices and equinoxes are actually 10 days before they are on the calendar. We've seen some of that evidence. Oh, thank you, Adam Moore is listening. Thank you for your answer, Adam. Everybody wave and say hi. Yeah, it's Floyd the Phenomenal Cat Trophy, AKA David Tantamount. You guys have really similar voices, Adam. has been notified. So he, he may pop up any second. <sighs> Did 
That's a pregnant pause. Yeah. Made me it's think pregnant. of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Here we are. Aha, there he is. Let me uh, make sure this song doesn't continue then. All right, let's stop the music nice. and switch over. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to RX Only Picture Show number 42. And we'd like to welcome our special guest this week, James Allen Egan, who is a prolific author and has exceptional theories about a tower and a museum even that he's going to tell us all about. And uh, there he is. Greetings. Uh, I'm calling from Newport, Rhode Island. So uh, we're broadcasting all over the world, aren't we, tonight? We are. We are worldwide. International. I love it. There's well, a portion of the world watching right now. Yes, there is. That's what we probably <laughs> got. We had such a fun phone conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, Did you have a question? Or do you want me to just uh, start things up? Well, um... You know, I did. I put a little bit of a description in there. We have been kind of buttering up our audience, uh, so if if you're ready, well, go ahead and uh, or if you're going to stand back a little bit, we might want to turn up our mic just a little bit over here for you. So yeah, good call. There you go. Yeah, because that should do it. All right. So yeah, this is James Deegan of uh, the Newport Tower Museum, and please please tell us what your museum is. Well, it's a museum dedicated to the history of this building. It's it's this strange building that nobody knows who built. This is a is, replica is, of it. Okay, that's a replica. Be, cool. Okay, so that's not the <laughs> actual building. Not the actual building. I'm going to show you the actual building in a minute, so do hold cool. on. But awesome. uh, this has uh, uh, been a mystery in Newport for many years, and uh, uh, it's even on the, uh, the city flag. Can you see the city flag here? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Amor Vincent Omnia, which was the first slogan of the settlers here. And in 1929, when they chose to have the flag, uh, the uh, the tower was replicated on it. What's, what does that mean, that Latin? It means love conquers all. It was the first oh, yeah. uh, slogan of the settlers here. And so hmm. they picked it up on the flag. And uh, this tower is kind of an icon here in Newport, but it's still unknown who built it. And it's kind of a mystery. And what I'm going to explain tonight is I think that it might have been built by this guy right here. Well, I think positively that it was built by this guy, Mr. John D., who some of your uh, viewers might be uh, might be familiar with. And in the paper, this is what they call me. I'm the Stone Temple pilot. Wow. So <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. To, to what's going on. But let me just explain, you know, who I am. Well, who, who is this guy? I uh, was born in uh, Belmont, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And uh, I went to Franklin and Marshall College. I studied business and art. And then afterwards, I lived in San Francisco. I lived in London for a while. And uh, then I became a professional photographer for 40 years. And while I was a professional photographer, I, uh, I, would, I lived out in rural western Rhode Island. And I would walk through the woods. And I'd find these stone structures that nobody knows who built. Uh, these and so I joined this lithic association. And we studied uh, stone structures. It's called a New England Antiquities Research Association, NERA, N-E-A-R-A. -A. You can go see their website. And uh, of all the structures all across New England, the tower was the strangest one, and nobody really studied it. Well, there was one other fellow member of NERA who studied it. His name was Professor William Penhallow, uh, who I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And uh, can you see Penhallow here? Yes. Yeah, he's about 80 years old. Very nice guy. And... Um, uh, and uh, he studied the tower for uh, 10 years and uh, over 10,000 hours, and he found these astronomical alignments in the windows of the tower that, uh, that aligned with the summer solstice, and then there's another lunar alignment, which I'll show you in a minute. But first, uh, the treat that I wanted to give you is that we're going to go outside and actually see the tower. Oh, wow. So, uh, so come on with me here. Ooh, through the fire escape? <laughs> through the front door. here this is exciting oh my mic's not all right hey wow this is like a field trip yeah yeah a, a virtual reality field trip can you see the tower um, yes goodness okay there it is right across the street from my museum on mill street that this is mill street right here and you see we're in newport with all these beautiful uh, mansions and such but in 1855 they preserved the the, the land around uh, the town the park uh, this park is called toro park uh, so that it would be forever preserved, and uh, the city of Newport owns this beautiful structure. 
And uh, you'll see that it has uh, eight uh, uh, pillars, very sturdy pillars. And then it's all made out of field stone, which I think was originally covered over. This is just the, 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 yeah, the remnants of what is there. And okay. uh, well, as we walk around it, you'll get a feel for the, the massive construction of it. It's not unlike anything that you'd see in colonial times. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, local field stones. Oh, and you lost the uh, video in there? Between Wait, them and we on some of the, uh, the pillars, you'll see that the mortar actually covered all of these stones. Hey, Jim? Jim, Jim, we, Jim, lo we, we lost your feed. Your, your finger must have bumped the screen there, and we're just getting your icon. We back? Let's see. There yes. we go. Yes, sir. Oh. Yes. oh, good. I'm glad you told me. So uh, I'm going to pause right here. And uh, can you see inside here? Yeah. Uh, yes. Inside this arch on the opposite wall is a fireplace. <coughs> it has two flues. And one goes up the right side, one up the left side. They're each seven inches by seven inches. Why is there a fireplace up there? Keep your ass warm, sister. <laughs> well, why would my ass be up there? <laughs> well, uh, well, just below it, there's a uh, there's a beam socket that you can see, and just to the right is another beam socket, and that's the that's the uh, uh, the beams for the first floor. The first floor beams were about one foot by one foot square, and there were four of them. Then they crisscross, made a tic tac toe pattern. So above that would be the level of the floor. So this floor. Uh, this fireplace is unusual because it's a, a wall fireplace. And uh, in colonial buildings, the hearth is always right on the ground. It's not built up like a foot and a half like this one is. And normally, uh, there's usually only one flue. There's not two flues. But the most unusual aspect of it is it has uh, an arch that goes across the top of it. Uh, and uh, on the right side, it's well supported. But on the left side, there's a window. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a black window. I'll show you a better picture of it when we get inside. And uh, these are, uh, there are only three windows on the first floor room of the tower. Above the fireplace, you'll see another beam socket and another one on the right. That's the second floor of the tower. And then the top, whatever was there, it's open to, open to the air right now, uh, no longer exists. <clears throat> so in this room on the first floor, there's three windows. That's the, the northeast window over there. In front of us here, you'll see the west window. And uh, around the corner, I'll show you in a second, the south window. Uh, but I wanted to show you a feature of this arch here. In the center of the arch is this uh, feature that looks like a keystone, but it's not in the center of the arch. And it has uh, uh, sort of triangular shoulders on this cut stone on the bottom. And then ab above it is this round reddish rock, which is uh, very important. Sort of, it's very definitely a symbol of something. It, you know, what it is, that's sort of a mystery for all. But... Uh, 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 directly behind it, on the interior, is a rock, which I'll show you when we get to the other side, that is shaped like an egg. So they're back to back in the tower. So wow. as you walk around the tower, there is the, uh, the west window. And there are these little ledges that stick out on the top of the, uh, these, uh, these, these beams here. And here's the south window. Uh, these windows are about two feet by two feet square. And they're only about three feet off of the ground. But there are different heights above the ground. They're not all on the same level. One is five feet above the ground, one's four feet, the other's three feet. And the third window is the northeast window. Here you can see it, or at least the shadow of it. And, uh, and then above that, you'll see way up at the top of these black holes, those are the two flues for the fireplace. So we'll take a quick look in this arch here. What I'm going to show you what Professor Penhall found was that on the winter solstice, December 21st, the sun rises behind me, shines through the south window, through the west window, and you observe it from the northeast corner of the park over there. And uh, it happens at uh, about 7.30 in the morning uh, on the 21st, and it only happens that time of year. Uh, and after the, that, the patch of light coming through the south window works its way down, and at 9 o'clock, it illuminates that egg-shaped rock in that arch, in the center of that arch right there. Well, again, that's not exactly off center. It's off to the right a little bit. And directly behind it is the, what we call the sunstone and the stone with shoulders. They're back to back in the tower. So that's a very important clue. Uh, on, the, on this uh, pillar that you'll see right here, you'll see the white plaster that once covered the whole interior of the tower. Uh, underneath uh, these, uh, these uh, large feet, uh, are, uh, these are actually drums that are a foot and a half tall. Only, you only see about six to eight inches of it right now. but in, in 1950, they did an excavation and found that the drum part, see this is three feet here, but down there it's four feet. And then underneath that, 
uh, underneath each of these pillars is three and a half tons of stone that goes four feet down to bedrock. So underneath this, this tower, you see about half of the stone you see here is underneath the ground. So this was uh, well thought out, and that's why it stood at least for centuries, because we know it was owned by uh, the first governor in the 1600s. Well, now, so I'll be, here, so I'm going to bid yeah. the tower at you, and we'll head back into the museum, and I'll explain what I've been doing in my research. So you uh, were the other day, so it's a little crunchy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all those astronomical alignments; those are things that were just recently, I mean, relatively recently discovered, right? I mean, just a, a few years ago. A good question. In 1990 was when Professor Penhollow wrote uh, a seven-page uh, paper, and he delivered it to the American Astronomical Society in Chicago, as well as to my NERA uh, group. And so, uh, you know, I mean, that's not, that's actually like, you know, 20 years now, almost 30 years now. But, but my uh, point is just that there was a long time that nobody knew that, oh, that right? Better. <laughs> there was a, there was a long time a period in which nobody knew that those features of the tower existed, right? I'm sorry. There there was a long period of time when p the tower was there, but nobody knew that all, there were all those astronomical astrono astrological astronomical astronomical <laughs> alignments. Yes. So well, it's, in other right. words, my my point is just that it it was thought of as something else before, right? I mean, it was not un well understood until recently. Yeah, that's right. No, in fact, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because there's five main theories about who built the tower. Uh, one is that it was built by the first governor of Rhode Island as a windmill, because in 1677, he writes in his will uh, that he deeds this to his daughter. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, But nobody studies the first governor of Rhode Island, even though he was governor for eight terms, because his name was Benedict Arnold. Mm. And uh, now this is not the I've traitor, this is the great, 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 great grandfather of the traitor of the same name. <laughs> but uh, because his name is Benedict Arnold, we've kind of thrown him out of Rhode Island history. Anyway, uh, the other theories about the tower are that it was built by the Vikings. Well, this theory came about in the 1800s by some guy in Scandinavia who had never even seen the tower. And he said, oh, definitely Vikings. And that's why around the corner you'll see the Viking Hotel and we got the Viking football team. Newport is very Viking because of the tower, but they've never found any tower uh, Viking artifacts. And uh, Vikings did not build with cement or build with arches. Uh, and then the other theory is that it was built by the Portuguese in uh, around 1500. Uh, Miguel Corto Real got abandoned by, on a shipwreck. And uh, they claimed that he built it, but he didn't have any tools or anything, and they never found anything about him. And then there's the Templar theory that uh, it was built in 1398 by an expedition uh, of the Scottish Earl Henry Sinclair. And uh, you might have seen uh, 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 America on Earth show with Scott Walter. He talks all about this. He's a big Templar enthusiast, but they never really found any Templar artifacts uh, near in Newport uh, e either. So uh, then there's a, the Chinese theory. This guy wrote uh, Gavin Menzies that it was built in 1421 by these huge ships of Chinese uh, as a pagoda lighthouse, and they left it here. But and so uh, uh, what I found out was that the Scandinavians think the Vikings built it, the Chinese think the Chinese built it, the Templars think the Templars, but everyone comes to the tower with their own theory. I'm like, well, that's not really very scientific. And, but the, the <laughs> Historical Society will tell you that it was, you know, that were, that it was a windmill. But if you look at uh, Benedict Arnold's original will, I don't know if you can see it here, where he writes my stone-built windmill, he puts five asterisks around it, one, two, three, four, five, as if, what that means is that there's an omission, something is left oh. out. So I said, well, let's study it from the top. And so, <laughs> do you have a question, Tech Trace? No, I'm just, that's a that, detail I hadn't heard before. Yeah, that's like, fascinating, wow, that's that, that there's all those asterisks. That's like, he's giving you the wink and the nod. Like, of course it's a windmill. Asterisk, asterisk, mm -hmm. asterisk, asterisk. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And uh, there are no asterisks in the margin. They're the only asterisks in the entire 12-page will. This is the original uh, of the will, which is in the John Carter Brown Museum at uh, Brown University. So I said, well, let's study it. So here's a, a top view. You see how perfectly circular it is. And there's the eight pillars. And you'll see how it, uh, it had a view over uh, all of Newport. Here it is down at the bottom of this picture here. And it, it looked over uh, Newport Harbor, all of Newport Town. This is to Goat Island and Jamestown. And then in the tower, as I said, you'll see the uh, fireplace and uh, the three windows. Uh, the, the west, that, that's the, uh, the northeast window, the west window, uh, and the south window here around the corner. 
And here's Professor Penhollow with his astrolabe. And he says if you stand over in this corner of the park, on the, on the, uh, right here, on, the, uh, on an event called Lunar Minor, which he said would happen on December 26, 1996, look through the west window, through the tower, and out the side, you'll see the full moon on this event called Lunar Minor. And so I went there that night, uh, and sure enough, the full moon ran right through those two windows. Wow. And that happened again in 18.6 uh, years later, on January 5th in 2015, and won't happen again till uh, 2033. So that sounds like a repeatable experiment. Yeah, you got to be for it. The other alignment that he had was, uh, it's called a lunar, uh, it's called the, uh, the Winter Solstice Alignment. And for that one, you stand in the northeast corner of the park, and at sunrise, the sun will come up above the horizon, and boom, and it shines right through these two windows, this, this space here. And uh, here it is, on, on, uh, uh, on, coming right through the two windows. And it happens Thank like God. clockwork every year. Here it was seven years ago, five years ago, four, six, three, two years ago. And I take pictures of it every year. Last year, we had 75 people uh, to come visit it. So uh, Professor Penhall was giving a lecture there one day at the tower, and he said the interior of the tower acted like a camera obscura solar disk calendar room. What's that, Jim? Well, yes. the camera obscura means dark room. In a dark room with one small hole, the image of what's outside appears on the interior. So if you have one small aperture, this is actually too large, all you need is a small, like uh, uh, a hole about this size, about a quarter of an inch, maybe three-eighths of an inch. Uh, the image of what's outside will appear on the interior. Now, this only happens during the daytime when it's bright outside because it's not bright enough. So I can't show you the camera obscura, but uh, but you can look it up. Or, uh, you've probably seen camera obscuras. They're basically just uh, cameras. In other words, uh, the, the aperture is like a, a camera aperture. And then on the back, this is a, a four by five camera. You'll see the image and it's upside down and backwards. Well, I was a professional photographer and I used one of these for 40 years. So I understood that, but I couldn't understand why the professor would say that this was uh, a, a camera obscura calendar room. Well, what I found was that in the image which appears into the, in the room here, and not only do you see everything upside down, normally I can show you uh, Bellevue Avenue, you see the cars driving by, people walking, everything's upside down. It's a beautiful view, but you'll also the, you see the image of the sky. Now, this whole face is south. So in my uh, camera, in this museum, uh, when I come in here in the morning in, Jan in, in, uh, in June, the sun is right here around 9 o'clock. And then it's here at 10 o'clock, 11, wow. 12, it crosses the noon line, 1, 2, 3, 4, and it will slowly set. And then the next day, it'll work up a, a little bit, and by, by fall, uh, September 21st, the solar disk goes across here, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then it works its way up, and on the winter solstice, December 21st, the sun goes across here, 9, 10, 11, 12, one, two, three, four. And so this is what's called the meridiana or noon line here. And so this is an amazing thing because you can tell not only the time of day, but the day of the year. It's a calendar and a clock. And as I said, the whole thing is an inside out sundial. So I said, well, if I study the history of the camera obscura room, I'll be able to figure out who built the tower. Wow. So that's what I studied. And the first thing I found was that in Italy, in the Renaissance, they converted these giant cathedrals that had already been built into camera obscura rooms. This is Maria degli Angeli in Rome, and there's the aperture up on the top, and the interior has been built by Michelangelo, and it had already been built, but on the floor, you'll see what's called a meridiana line, or a rose line, and it's embedded oh, sure. right in the floor. It's in bronze, with all of the days of the year marked off, and there are several, uh, you know, uh, churches all throughout Italy. So that's what, in the Da Vinci Code, that's what the rose line was that they uh, made a big deal about at uh, St. Sulpice on the floor. It's just the same sort of thing. It's the exact same thing. Yeah, that one's in St. Sulpice. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in fact, there's a, a very noted uh, astronomer by the name of J.L. Heilbronn, one of, the, one of the greatest astronomers in America, and he just wrote this book called The Sun in the Church, uh, Cathedrals as Solar Observatories. It's a, it's a really thick scholarly book that discusses them all. Well, what they did was... This is in uh, Santa Maria Novella, which is in Florence. They, on the line, uh, the, the, uh, they watched with the, the, the summer solstice hit cross the line, 
And when the sun crossed on the equinox and on the winter solstice and counting the number of days, they were able to prove to Pope Gregory the 13th that the Julian calendar that Julius Caesar had invented was out of sync from the sun by 10 days, leading to the Gregorian calendar reform of 1582. That's the calendar we still use today. And so uh, Da Vinci says, uh, you'll see everything upside down with one of these, and so does the pupil. They knew that the eye acted as a camera obscura in the Renaissance. And this is the first image we have, uh, Gemma Frisius. He was uh, uh, in the Northern Renaissance in 1544. He shows an eclipse of the sun in a camera obscura. Cardano in 1550, the Italian, he says, use a biconvex lens and you make things sharper. They had lenses back then, they had glasses. And the only guy in England who knew about the camera obscura, or at least wrote about it, was a guy by the name of John Dee. And this is uh, in 1550. He shows an eclipse of the sun to the ambassador uh, from Poland. And that was, yeah. This is John Dee, the, uh, the Enochian magic guy. That's right, that very guy, yeah. He, and so uh, he was uh, also a great scientist. Uh, but the point is, uh, in the 1700s, they used this as a drawing aid. Artists like Vermeer and Candeletto learned the art of perspective by making these boxes with camera obscuras on it. And then in the 1800s, they put film in the back, and, and you got the first uh, photographs. And then uh, in the 1900s, they invented these, uh, you know, uh, brownie box cameras, and then we got Nikons and Leicas, and now we take pictures of our cell phone, but even in a, cam uh, a cell phone, you have to have a camera obscura. That's the way it works. So you were saying that uh, artists used to make one of these things to make a projection of whatever was outside in, in their little studio, and then they could kind of basically trace over it, and that would be a way of uh, representing something artistically? It, it was a, an aid for, for uh, drawing and painting? Exactly. Absolutely, yeah. It's an aid to actually to learn the art of perspective. That the art of perspective was just starting to come about in the Renaissance, and it's one of the things that changed the course of Western uh, civilization was the understanding of perspective. A guy by the name of Al, uh, uh, Leo Battista Alberti wrote about it, and it became part of, uh, 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 and it's what changed uh, Renaissance art. You see there's a huge change from the 1400s into the 1500s, 1600s of the way art was. So yeah. as I was studying this first governor of Rhode Island, whose name was, as I said, Benedict Arnold, he was not only the first governor, but he was the first one here, and I claim he came here, and being the first one, he claimed the tower. And he you had the one that, his whole life. You, you, you drew some and, uh, of these uh, drawings yourself, but right? As I was studying all that, I was in the library one day and serendipity happened. You know what that means? Yeah. So we walk in and, and I saw this book and it says historical names for Narragansett Bay. And on the list it says a refugio. You see, Verrazano had been here in 1527 and he called it a refuge for an entire navy. And Verrazano was sailing for the French king. Uh, and then the Spanish call it uh, the Bay of Santa Baptista. And then I saw this, the John D. Bay and River, 1583. Wow. John D., why would this building be named after this guy, John D.? And he's the only guy that knew about the camera obscura. So I started studying about John D. Uh, 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 he was a mathematician, astronomer, an expert on navigation and cartography. All these been, books have been written about John D. And he had a library, 4,000 books. Uh, this is John D's library catalog. He wrote down every book that he owned. So we have a complete record uh, of, uh, of all of the books. It's, it's written in Latin, wow. but it was hey, very well coded. Can I ask something? Uh, did, did anyone else say that John D. Bay had been named after this John D? Had anyone else noted that before? Yeah, I'll explain that in a second. It's been known right. since 1934. Yeah, yeah. Nice. But uh, just a little bit about John D. is that when I go through this this book, I'm like, I wonder if he knew anything about, uh, you know, Geber, who was a great uh, uh, scientist. Oh, look, he had all of Geber's books, and he had Robert <laughs> Grotesque, who was uh, who, who was uh, an expert on uh, on vision, and, and uh, he had all of Grotesque books. Hermes Trismegistus, look, he's going to hold all these Hermes books here. You know, D was just a polymath. Hippocrates, he had all these. Anyway, in 1577, he was, he was the Queen's advisor, uh, Queen Elizabeth, and he wrote these uh, eight books telling her that she had a legal right to all of North America because earlier Englishmen like King Arthur and Prince Maddox and John Sebastian Cabot had been to the New World and claimed it for England. And in this book, he coins the term the British Empire. It's called The Limits of the British Empire. He's the first one to use that term and later grew into the largest empire in the world has ever known. He, he, he also, question? Oh, no. Uh, 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 he go also, ahead. I uh, think you're probably getting there. Go ahead. 
Okay. He I, also uh, uh, encouraged the, the, uh, the queen to, uh, to build a navy of 60 to 80 large ships because uh, Spain had 200 ships in their fleet and England had but 20. And he said, if we don't get a foothold in the New World and we don't uh, you know, have a navy, ain't going to be no more England. He was also the navigational guide to all the great Elizabethan explorers. And he invented what's called the paradoxical compass that allowed you to navigate at the northernmost latitudes where the longitude lines were close together. This is the front cover of his book. It's called General and Rare Memorials. And up at the top, he says, uh, plural latent quam patent, which means more is hidden than meets the eye. And uh, in <laughs> this uh, illustration, uh, which I'll preview in a little more detail later, the people of England are on their knees pleading, send forth a sailing expedition to build a steadfast watch post. And there's the watch post here. And, and this is Lady Occasion or Lady Luck standing on the top of it. And then here's Queen Elizabeth guiding the ship of state. It says Elizabeth right up at the top there. And uh, you see that the sun, the moon, the stars are all aligned. And uh, down on the side here are these five ships. And they enter this bay, uh, which is kind of like a river. And, uh, and they start trading. And then this city is developed down. So Dee was saying, if you seize the opportunity, that's what Lady Opportunity is all about. All of this good stuff can happen. But if you don't, Danger lurks, boom, 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 and he has a skull down at the bottom here on the, on the far side. He calls it Hieroglyphicon Britannicon, the British Hieroglyphic. Would Question. you, uh, would you uh, give us a shot of Lady Occasion there and, and hold it still for a sec so we can see what she looks like? If you... Oh, here's Lady Occasion. Yeah, I'll start on her. Uh, try and get the, uh, here she is, the top of her. But oddly enough, look what she's standing on. A little pyramid. A tetrahedron. A ah. geometric shape. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of weird, huh? And here uh, she is. So, uh, this is uh, this is uh, she's here's this uh, this great mountain, and there are these great uh, great uh, uh, ballers, these uh, these pillars in front of this this uh, this uh, fortress, this sort of thing. And she's on a mountain in the background. Anyway, one month uh, later, she deeds all of North America to this guy, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, one of her bravest courtiers in the war in Ireland. Well, Gilbert didn't have enough money for the mission, and so. They got this guy by the name of Sir George Peckham to finance the expedition. He uh, and a fellow by the name of Thomas Gerard were two of the wealthiest Catholics in, uh, in England. And, and Walsingham promised them that if the uh, Catholics financed the expedition, all the Catholics that settled in that colony would have complete freedom of religion. Well, you see, uh, there was a lot of fighting between the... the, uh, the uh, the Catholics and the and the uh, and the English. I don't know if I'll get into all of that history, but basically, uh, Henry VIII was Catholic, and then his son Edward VI, he was Protestant, and then Mary, his sister, who ruled for five years, she was Catholic, and then Elizabeth came to the throne. So they were going back and forth. So Elizabeth passed the Recusancy Act, and he, a Catholic who did not attend the Church of England, was fined twenty pounds a month, thrown into prison if they couldn't pay. So this was a way to get the Catholics out of England because their jails were filled with them. And uh, also a way for the Catholics to have a settlement uh, of, 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 of their people, you know. And so it was a win-win-win situation for everybody. And then Gilbert got the financing. And he was so appreciative, Gilbert was, of the work that Dee did for him in convincing the Queen. He gives John Dee all the lands north of the 50-degree line. That's all of Alaska, and that's Canada, and, that's, uh, and that is Greenland. All went to John Dee, and then Gilbert got the rest, except for Florida and uh, in uh, Mexico, it was with the Spanish work, but all the rest of it, all the 50-degree line. You guys just made it into Gilbert territory, it looks like. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this guy Peckham goes over to Dee's house. We know that because Dee left a diary. He can talk about, about, about it. He tells it the exact day, 3.30 in the afternoon on the 21st of, 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 of June. And he shows him this May. This guy Peckham says, are you sure Spain doesn't own the whole East Coast? And so John Dee shows them this map. This is part of John Dee's map of, uh, of North America. And he drew that. Uh, there is Florida down at the bottom here. And then here is uh, South Carolina, North Carolina. And here is, uh, you know, uh, New York Harbor. It's, uh, they call it Norumbega. And then he says, you don't want to go down here where, where the Spanish are, and you don't want to go up here where the French are. You want to go to this triangular island, which is Block Island, a little island off the coast of Rhode Island. And uh, on, uh, 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 just above it, you'll see this beautiful bay. I don't know if you can see it or if it's out of focus. 
But it's, a, it's a bit out of focus. But do you, do you think that the the tetrahedron then that she's standing on and the bay that they're in in that graphic is actually kind of meant to represent this right here? Yeah. As a matter of fact, hey, you're getting heady today for yourself here. Yeah. It actually uh, the tetrahedron. You see, this is a a, a rebus. He tells us more is hidden than meets the eye, and that the, the tetrahedron is actually four clues about uh, a triangle. One of them is the triangular island. And I'll explain that a little bit. Very good, right. you picked up on that. It took okay. me five years to figure that out. You figured it out in five seconds. <laughs> right. But let's uh, let's 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 continue with the story. And the reason that we know about all of this is that they found this deed in the Elizabethan State Papers in 1934 between Sir Humphrey Gilbert and Sir George Peckham, and it's dated to February 28, 1583. I deed you all that river court called by Master John D. The D River. Look, he named it after himself. Wow. Which, by the description of Verrazano, lies at northerly latitude at 42 degrees, which is, what's 42? It's the answer to everything. Yeah. Right. Is this show 42? He, didn't know that. he hadn't, hadn't read the book. But, um, <laughs> but also, this is your 42nd podcast, is that right? Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. the 42nd show, so we've got some synchronicity going here. Maybe we'll solve some more riddles. What is the latitude? Uh, you know, he says about 42. We're actually 41 and two thirds, but uh, he was uh, calling it 42. Uh, and then uh, he describes it. He says the mouth is opening to the south, half a league broad, and then it goes northeast for about uh, 12 leagues, and then it makes a bay 20 leagues in circumference in which there are five small islands. That is a perfect description of Narragansett Bay. And the whole... Uh, colony was going to take about half of what is now Connecticut and most of Rhode Island. So this has been known since 1935 when they found this deed in the Elizabethan State Papers. Oh, you still with me? Yeah, I am. Yeah, that, uh, we lost your camera view there, but we can still hear you, Jim. So um, Okay. Can you see? Oh, you can't see the camera view. No, something, uh, I, I think um, occasionally you're getting a, a bump on the screen there. There it is. Now it's coming back. Okay, we're back. We're back on. Yep. So, as I said, this was found in 1934. This, uh, this fellow from Connecticut went, went to uh, London and looked him up in the, in the, in the, in the state papers, and, and he wrote about it in the, in the, uh, the uh, this is the Rhode Island Historical Society Collections, the D River of 1583, and then there was another article written about it uh, a year later, and uh, David Beers Quinn, most noted authority on Elizabethan exploration, he uh, wrote about it in England, the Discovery of America. You go to chapter 18, he talks all about it. He says, yeah, definitely, Rhode Island, uh, Narragansett Bay is the site for this colony. And then uh, Samuel Elliott Morrison from Harvard, he writes about it in the Northern Voyages. And not one Rhode Island historian has ever written about it. Huge effort to colonize the New World by the Elizabethans, whose language we speak, and, uh, and, and uh, the building, and nobody knows who built it. Nobody ever pieces it together. It might have something to do with each other. So <laughs> that was just the beginning of my, my, my research. What I found was this. In 1583, Sir Humphrey Gilbert set sail with five ships and 280 men. He made it as far as St. John's in Newfoundland, but more people got sick. So uh, uh, the, 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 first, uh, the first ship, the, the Bark Raleigh, had gotten, uh, gotten a contagious disease, so they had to head back home. And then when they arrived in St. John's, the other four ships, more people got sick, so they sent the Swallow home. Well, these other three ships stayed there for two weeks to revictualize, and then coming down the coast, they hit a tempest, and Sir Humphrey Gilbert uh, lost the delight. It got crushed to pieces. The two smaller ships headed back to England, and off the coast of the Azores, they hit another tempest, and Sir Humphrey Gilbert's ship got swallowed up by a huge wave, and he drowned. He never made it here. The deed to North America became void. Deeds Canada became void, the whole thing, because the deed was just in his name. So historians have said, well, he couldn't have built the tower, Jim, because he never made it here. And that's absolutely true. But this Quinn was a great researcher. After studying all he could in London, uh, he went to Madrid and found out that the Spanish ambassador who was living in London, Don Bernardino de Mendoza, had written letters back to King Philip of Spain, in which he explains that 1582, a year before Gilbert goes, there is a preliminary expedition of two ships and 80 men under the leadership of uh, Anthony Brigham. Well, I did research and found out that Anthony Brigham was best friends with this guy, Sir George Peckham, uh, because his father had been the master of the mint, and his father had been the assistant master of the mint, but they got fed up with Queen Elizabeth, and they went, they went to Rome with their eldest son, left all of their money to the second sons, and these guys were going to save Catholicism. And so this was to be a Catholic colony, but... 
uh, it's being an Anglican colony, but the Catholics could worship as they please. So I claim that he came here sir, uh, a year before Sir Humphrey Gilbert and with the two ships and built this tower to be the city center of this first Elizabethan colony. You see, back then you had to build what's called a token of occupation. A building that uh, that represented that, you, and you had to occupy it for a year, and so that's what I claim this was. You'll see that uh, he's listed here. Anthony Brigham is in the history books. This is a book written in 1582, and he talks all about it. So this happened in 1582. Uh, they built the tower, and then Sir Humphrey Gilbert drowned, and so the colonization effort came to a grinding halt. But a year later, the Queen deeded all of North America to Sir Humphrey Gilbert's younger half brother, and you know who he was? I forgot. Sir Walter Raleigh yes. made three expeditions uh, to Roanoke Island in 1584, 5 and 7. That's Gilbert's baby brother. And uh, everybody's heard of Sir Walter Raleigh, you know, the lost colony, Virginia Dare, all of that stuff. But nobody's ever heard of this guy Gilbert because he didn't make it past Maine. And we're Americans and we don't care about Canadian history because we got our own history. <laughs> Man, those kids look bummed. Are they this lost? This drawing was done in the 1800s of uh, this Genoese sailor saying, uh, oh, across the sea you'll find these beautiful lands. And it inspired, uh, uh, this is John Francis Millay, and this is, uh, this is Gilbert, and this is his, uh, his, his half-brother, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh. That's why they have uh, uh, different last names. But they grew up together, and, and in fact, uh, Bark Raleigh was led by, uh, by Sir Walter Raleigh on this expedition right here. So I went up to Canada, and right there in the middle of town, it says, there's a plaque next to the Sir Humphrey Gilbert building near this spot where, uh, where Sir Humphrey Gilbert landed on the 5th day of August, 1583, taking possession of this newfound land in the name of Sovereign Queen Elizabeth, thereby founding Britain's overseas empire. Look, he's on stance, and that'd be the founder of the British Empire right there. But he stayed there for two weeks to pick up some fish and some, some, some meat to eat. And, uh, and so uh, this is where he was really headed. So in 1583, something else happens. France, Italy, Germany, Spain, and they all changed the calendar because the Pope had decreed it. But in England, the Queen didn't know what to do. She's been excommunicated by the Pope. She needs advice. Who does she turn to for advice? You know it. John D. Mr. D. Are these John your drawings, D. Jim? Some of these are your own art? Uh, yeah, so all of these are my own photographs, all my, all my own drawings. Yeah, yeah. They're great. <laughs> well, Just so you know, they're great. We love them. Oh, thanks. <laughs> they're kind of cartoony, but I have fun with it. So uh, Dee is asked by the Queen to write uh, uh, a proposal as to whether they should change the calendar. And he says, yeah, you can tell from these cameras, girls are off by 10 days. In fact, astronomers have known it for centuries. Uh, they just haven't been able to convince the Pope um, until they finally told him that he was going to be celebrating Easter on the wrong day. Well, this is a part of the first page of Dee's uh, discourse. And he says, we should change it. And he says, if the, you change it first before the Pope, then you'll be the woman who changed time. Elizabeth, our Empress Bright, who in the year of 83 thus made truth come to light and civil year with heaven agree. And he draws this thing called the circle of time, which starts with, down at the bottom with Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, the sons of Israel, the fall of the temple, Olympic games, uh, uh, Maton, uh, Hipparchus, Jesus, Mo The very Whoa. last one after Copernicus is... Queen Elizabeth, the reformer of the year for the next Christian epoch, and that's to begin in the year 1583, the exact same year I say that tower was built. So that tower represents the birth of this new time, the beginning of the British Empire, and the reason why <clears throat> I'm speaking to you in English today. That's what I claim John Dee. So John Dee in 1582, he was on top of the world. He had solved the problem of religious strife. The new world was opening up, and they gave him these rectories of a thousand pounds a year. The following year, Sir Humphrey Gilbert drowned. And uh, the deed to North America becomes void. The Queen approves the plan for the calendar. The head of the English church says, you know, if this is something the Pope is doing, we don't want to do that. And they did not make the change. And for the next 169 years, the English calendar was different European calendars by 10 days because they didn't listen to John Dee. And then they took the rectories away because he forgot to get the official seal by the due date. And so he was so irritated with his countrymen, he gets on a boat with his family, sails down the Thames River, and spends the next eight years in the courts of various kings and, and princes throughout Northern Europe. This is the time that uh, he, he met up with Edward Kelly just before, and they, he was on the sojourn with his, with his wife as well. Well, before D uh, traveled to Europe, he'd written over 40 books. And this is the first English translation of Euclid, the greatest geometry book ever written. And he adds addendums and corollaries to many of the former six CT5 propositions. It's a thousand-page book, and it's so complex, I can hardly read it. 
At the very beginning, he writes a preface which explains all the known mathematical arts at the time. Perspective, music, astronomy, cosmography, uh, uh, astrology, uh, anthropology, all of these strange uh, subjects, there are 14 of them. Zography is the art of painting. And he says these are all derivative arts, derivative from two things, arithmetic and geometry. He was a total math geek. Everything was about mathematics for John Dee. And, and he says in one of his, in his book, he says, an architect's work must be based on uh, the principles of geometry, arithmetic, and optics. Regarding optics, I mean the lights of heaven are well led in the buildings from certain quarters of the world. Well, that's exactly what Penthouse found in this building. Here's a guy talking about buildings with alignments. And he says, if you don't understand astronomy, uh, or east-west and, and north-south of the equinoxes, you won't understand horometry, which is the art of keeping time. And he says, when I was young, I invented horizontal dials and mural dials, but sometimes you can't see the sun, moon, and stars, so they invented a way to use a flow of water and then running sand gears and weights, and then springs. But all of these methods require correction over time because the inaccuracy of their own operation. How would they correct them? He says, there remains among the philosophers a more excellent, marvelous way than all of these to imitate the motion of the skies by using nature and art, which you shall understand more of by further search in weightier studies. And he calls it a perpetual motion. Well, we still haven't invented a perpetual motion machine, but he saw that this camera obscura solo disc was going to be perpetual motion. The, the sun is always going to be moving across the floor. So why doesn't he say, make a dark room and put a hole in it, and you have a calendar on the floor that will tell you not only the time of day, but the day of the year? Why doesn't he say that? Because along trouble. with the image of the sun projected on the floor, you also have an image of everything that's going on outside. That's what a camera obscura is. And, and, and so it, 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 let's say that people were over at Dee's house, and he showed them the camera obscura, and all of these people were walking across. Oh, I saw Fred. He was on, per on his horse outside, and he had his purple hat on, and he was upside down on Dee's wall. They were all in miniature. And then as, as soon as Dee opened the window, they all went away. Yeah, we all saw it. You get your head cut off of that stuff. So Dee had to write cryptically about it. Now, uh, I you're, wish, saying, you know, you're saying it was uh, too we'll weird for the over. time? We'll, we'll, uh, we'll show you what the camera obscura looks like, but uh, you can Google it and find, uh, and find <laughs> out what it is. So. He knew all about the camera obscura, and he studied optics, and he saw that that was responsible for the art of per Jim, I want to stop you for just a second there. Because you didn't have people walking across your walls. Well, he wrote this book that, uh, that cryptically uh, explains part of it. It's called Propodumata Aphoristica, which means preparatory aphorisms. And he dedicates it to his best friend, Gerard Mercator, who he studied with in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Louvain when he studied under Gemma Frisius. Uh, Mercator is the famous for his globes and the Mercator projection of maps. And mm -hmm. he's, uh, uh has two columns. You see he's interested in classical architecture. These are uh, a solid foundation, two uh, Corinthian columns, uh, pilasters, and then uh, an entablature and a dome with stars on the top. This is called the sun column and the moon column. The ID, Johannes D, those are his initials. And he invents this symbol called the Mona symbol, which has the moon on the top and then the sun the cross of the elements, fire, air, earth, and water, and the symbol for Aries. And so you've got uh, planetary things, you've got uh, earthly things, the fire, air, earth, and water, and then you have uh, zodiacal things, the fixed stars. Seven years later, he writes his most cherished work, the Monas Hieroglyphica, sacred symbol of oneness. And in this, he uses the same sort of architectural motif on the front cover, and he, again, he has the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the Monas symbol, and here he puts it inside an egg shape, uh, and uh, you see it has the same uh, columns and such, and uh, up at the top, uh, the same architectural uh, dome with stars on it, and up at the top it says, he does not understand, he non intelligit otasiat odiska, should either learn or keep silent. Well, Queen Elizabeth sees the book and she says, John, you must explain this to me. So he spends a day explaining to the Queen, and he dedicates it to Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian, head of all of Northern Europe. And when he goes to Prague, he explains it to the emperor's son, who was Emperor Rudolf II, who was uh, into alchemy and all of this, this stuff as well. And it, it's his uh, book that explains it. It was G.D. most cherished book out of books that he wrote. At the very book, he has his chart called, Thus the World Was Created, Six Factus Es Mundus. And uh, this, uh, on the top part, a super area. And then on the bottom, it has the, the, the terrestrial and etheric celestial area. And... Uh, and he had these numbers of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then metamorphosis, consorizing of eternity, and uh, the word sabatizat here, 
And down at the bottom, you've only got one through seven in the terrestrial area, the Monas symbol upside down and backwards, and various quaternaries, fire, air, earth, and water. Here he has uh, a one, two, three, two, body, mind, spirit. And here he has a uh, black, clear, yellow, red. These are alchemical stages. And nobody's been able to figure out the chart or the book for the last 450 years. They say the knowledge of what he's talking about is no longer with us. But there was one person who was able to figure out what D was talking about in the chart. Some people think it was Sir Isaac Newton, but it wasn't Sir Isaac Newton, and it wasn't D himself. He doesn't count. You know who was in, who was that was able to figure out that chart and book when nobody else in the world could? Hmm. No. Take a guess. Is it Bucky? No. Good guess. <laughs> hmm. uh, me, Jim Egan. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to figure it out. Well, I went to the library of Congress. I got a copy of the book. It's written in Latin. It's been translated six times by various people since the, the 1600s. I got all the translations, and I made my own <laughs> translation. Here's the, a copy of the book, and he starts off very simply with a point, line, and circle after ded a dedication to Maximilian. And uh, the book is a, uh, is a, a, a sort of a rebus where he, he takes the Mona symbol and uses it as a rhetorical device. He turns it around. He puts it, turns it upside down. But he says it's very important that you make the Mona symbol exactly these proportions. And he goes through this entire geometric proof, and he says the moon has to be just so big, and that it's the same diameter as the sun, and the the uh, the arms of the, of the cross are the same radius as the, moon, the diameter of the sun, and the Aries symbol, uh, uh, the, they are the. Uh, the diameter of that is equal to the radius of the sun. He says, very important to make it exactly these proportions, otherwise it loses all of its power. Well, for proportions, he says, you can make it a little bit larger, but you have to keep the original uh, proportions on it. And at the very end of his book, where he has his chart, uh, he has another chart that is called, uh, that he summarizes, his summary chart, and he goes through all of these numbers, and down at the bottom, the very base, he boils it all down to one number. He calls it the master number, magistralia. And lap firm means lapidification fermentation. The philosopher's stone of number is 252. He says if you can figure out 252, you'll figure out the whole book. Well, I figured out 252. I figured out the whole book, and inside this book I found a hidden blueprint for the tower that's across the street. Wow. I know. I know you think huh? it's crazy. I don't care. <laughs> I'm the one that paid. So here's my translation, by the way, which both of these are available on Amazon. And... and uh, uh, the English translation. I just ordered that one there. 252. The people didn't have in the 1800s and 1900s. Guess what my tool was to figure out 252? Um, Astrolabe? Nope. Hand calculator? Nope. A compass and Astro square. Slide rule? Nope. Camera obscura? Nope. Calculator? Damn calculator? Good guess. No. Nope. <laughs> you know how I figured it out? I Tell Googled us. it. Uh, <laughs> ask the oracle maybe it's important to him maybe it's important to somebody else and when I google 252 guess who shows up you gotta go Johnny. into the back room you guys now have permission to come into the magic magic back room and I'll explain Sweet. who it is that shows up with Buckminster <laughs> his name was cool. Buckminster Fuller yeah the Bucky Fuller of the 20th century now, Bucky invented the geodesic dome. You go down to Walt Disney World in Florida, that dome, it's all made out of triangles and such. He invented it. And, and, uh, and when he died in, in 1983, before he died, he said, I'm going to write down the most important things that I learned in life. And he did in these two books called Synergetics 1 and Synergetics 2. They're a little challenging to read, but unfortunately, there was a woman by the name of Amy Edmondson, and uh, she wrote a fuller explanation. She studied with Bucky at MIT. And uh, once you read Amy, then you can understand Bucky. And what Buckminster Fuller found out about geometry and number in the 1900s was the exact same thing that John Dee found out about geometry and number in the 1500s. So once I figured out what Bucky was talking about, I was able to figure out uh, all of what uh, John Dee was talking about and, and find the hidden blueprint in the tower. Whoa. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Now, uh, it usually takes another half hour, it's going to take 45 minutes to explain all of what Buckminster Fuller did, but I'll boil it down into, uh, into about one minute here, just to give you some highlights if you want. I mean, the whole thing is explained more clearly with diagrams and such in a book, but Buckminster basically said that the, the basic um, 
a structural experience of universe, the simplest shape is a, a triangle because a, a square uh, will not hold its shape, nor will a five-sided figure, but a, a triangle is perfectly rigid. And in three dimensions, that becomes a tetrahedron, which, of course, the lady occasion is standing on. And, uh, and Bucky says, though, uh, now, this is nothing new. There are five platonic solids, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the cube, and the icosahedron, and the dodecahedron. But this is the simplest one. But Bucky says you can't have an energy event with just one thing. You can't have yin without yang. You can't have positive without negative. He says, to have an energy event, you need to have two tip-to-tip -tip tetrahedra. And these are, are oriented so that these lines go straight through each other. There's one tetrahedra on the top, another one on the bottom. So if you look at it this way, there's uh, an upright triangle on this side and uh, a, 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 an inverted triangle on the other yeah, side. Yeah. Well, if you take four of these Bucky bow ties, that's what I call a Bucky bow tie, put them together, one, two, three, four, that's four pairs of them, you get this shape here, it's called a cube octahedron. And uh, Bucky says that this shape, the energy in this shape, is the closest thing we will ever know to eternity in God. It has uh, triangular faces and square faces. There are eight triangles and, and uh, six square faces. And I put the radii in here. Now, why Bucky was so excited about it is that this is the only shape out of all the platonic and Archimedean solids where the radiating vectors, the one that come from the center out to the edges, is the exact same length as the edge vectors. In other words, I made this model out of a lot of uh, four inch lollipop sticks, and you can't do that with any of these other uh, shapes uh, 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 that are the Archimedean solids or the platonic solids. That's because this is the shape that's made out of tetrahedral. Well, this relates to a thing called closest packing of spheres. If you have one sphere, exactly 12 spheres fit around it perfectly, and they make the shape, which is the cube octahedral shape. Look, it has triangles and it has squares in it. So there's one square or circle, a sphere in the middle, and 12 around the outside. Well, uh, if you continue by continuing uh, more, more layers, the second layer of closest packing of spheres has uh, uh, 42 spheres in it. Mm -hmm. Again, 42 showing up here. And then uh, the, 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 the next layer has 92 spheres, and, and layer 4 has uh, 162 spheres. And guess how many the, the next layer of, two, uh, 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 spheres, uh, of spheres are in it? 250, 252. 252. Uh, D's magisterial number, exactly. Oh, it's beautiful, too. And so uh, this yeah. is the fifth layer closest packing the spheres, and it's a very important uh, layer of... Uh, a much longer story that has to do with numbers and such. But uh, not only is this involved in, in numbers, but it's also involved in, uh, excuse me, geometry. It also involves numbers in the, in the sense that uh, you take the number 12 and multiply it times its opposite, which is 21, 12 times 21, uh, makes 252. And, uh, and, and if you have one sphere, a uh, circle, and exactly six circles fit around uh, one perfectly. Well, if each one is... Uh, 360 degrees, that's 360 times 7, that's 2,520. And 2,520 is a very special number, the D and everything. He calls it the Sabatizat. That's what his Sabatizat is. But um, it's the lowest number divisible by all the single digits. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. No other number can you divide all these digits into. And those are the only digits we have. After that, you get into tens or using the numbers over again. Uh, it's the lowest number divisible by all of them. Uh, and this has been known for years. Uh, Plato, when he writes uh, The Ideal City uh, in, 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 in one of his books, he said the ideal city is 5,040 people. Well, that's 2520 times 2. So this is not anything new, but it's sort of like sacred knowledge that, uh, Kabbal that you know, the Jewish uh, uh, Kabbalists knew about. And certainly the people in India knew about it. Uh, in other words, this it goes way back uh, to the people that gave us our uh, sort of designed the numbers, the, the Hindu Arab, Arabic number system. And uh, uh, the reason I was able to figure all this out is uh, not necessarily Bucky, but a guy came up to Bucky just before, uh, uh, in about 1980. His name was Robert Marshall. And Robert Marshall uh, said to Bucky, uh, uh, what well, you started to find out about numbers, I found even more of. And so well, Marshall uh, uh, wrote him uh, these, uh, these letters, and Bucky was so excited about uh, Marshall's work, uh, he wrote him a letter back, and he said, 
this work, uh, uh, you're, at any rate, your work fills me with joy. Would you be willing to have me publish this work in another edition of Synergetics with full credit to you? Buckminster Fuller, this is 1981, this is the letter. Wow. And, uh, and then uh, a, a, a short while later, after they started working on the book, Bucky died. The book never got written. Well, I found out about Marshall on the web because he knew about 252, and so uh, we corresponded for 10 years, and I went out to California. He lived in Fort Bragg to visit him, and, uh, and he taught me everything he knew, and then uh, two years ago, Robert Marshall died. So oh. I'm the only one that knows. <laughs> Anyways, I'm here to share it with the world, but the world is slow to get. But anyway, what I found out was that when Dee lists uh, consumata and metamorphosis here, those are the exact same things that Robert Marshall taught me. He called them something different. He called them the holotomes and the cycloflex. But I realized they were both talking about the same thing. So once I understood Robert Marshall, I was able to understand uh, uh, John Dee and, and uh, what, what, what Dee was all talking about. So he was an important clue. But I just wanted to explain one thing about 252, which is, which, uh, is kind of a, a very interesting thing. You see, Marshall was a hippie. He lived in Haight-Ashbury in the summer of 67. And uh, he uh, had this mind for numbers. He was not an academic. Uh, he was a hippie, and, uh, but he had this mind. He just, you know, some people have just gifts, you know? Well, he was gifted with number patterns. So uh, one day he went up to this guru, because the gurus were coming to town in 67 in San Francisco, and, and he said, uh, I, I study number patterns. What number should I study? And the guru said, study the number 108, sacred number of the Hindus. So Marshall said, uh, Marshall worked at a machine sh sh shop, and Marshall bit, uh, built this uh, uh, this, uh, oh, this uh, machine you're... that was able to project these no, numbers out. And he, it's a 108 wheel, and it goes out to uh, 108, uh, and then 216 and 225, and it goes all the way up. And, uh, and so by studying all this, that's how Marshall is able to understand 252. Well, guess what happens if you add 108 and 252 together? Perfect circle. So what these Hindus, ancient Hindus were talking about, the sacred number, uh, 108, is the exact same thing. I call this the sacred number of the West. This is the sacred number of the East. Uh, and if you have a mala, which is uh, the sacred beads that they, that they wear in, uh, for, for, for like the rosary of, uh, of Vedics, uh, uh, that has 108 beads in it, 108 uh, bricks in the fireplaces, 108 verses in the Rig Veda. 108 is a huge number. Anyway... So all of this stuff, this mathematics that Dee talked about, this cosmology, is, uh, is sort of like, uh, it, it's, been, it's been around for a while, but Dee compiled it all into one sort of mathematical kind of uh, uh, a game and riddled with it in the Monas Hieroglyphica. Now, uh, Dee also talks about optics. I won't get into the whole thing, but basically uh, what he says is that, uh, is that uh, vision and how the eye works, he learned this from Al Faraday, he says, if you take a, a tetrahedron, which when made full circle, it means if you have both sides of it, a mirror may be found. Well, that's the image in the camera obscura. Even when the sun is blocked by clouds, it even works on cloudy days, can reduce uh, stones and metal into impalpable powders. Well, you, you, the cars and the trees and the people, you can't touch them. They're like powder by the force of truly the very strongest heat. And so this is uh, a riddle about the camera obscura and this is uh, the bucky bow tie is the thing that explains it. In other words, if you have an upright triangle on one side, in the camera obscura, it's going to be upside down, just like my images on my camera. And he says, uh, I can show you by actual experience that the element of earth can float above that of water. Well, if his kids are playing in the mud uh, outside and the Thames River is off beyond, inside, the element of earth floats above that of water. Anyway, all of my work is based on Elizabethan history, Rhode Island history, John D. history, mathematics, optics, and time. That's about a tenth of my library. Here's the hidden blueprint for the tower. I won't go through the whole thing, but basically you take the thus the world was created chart, and uh, you, uh, you, you put it on the title page, and then you figure out the grid that he uses, which is 36 by 48, and in between, it's 24 by 48. Well, I claim those are the proportions of the original tower, 24 feet in diameter. It's still 24 today. And it was literally 48 feet high, and I think it looked like this. This is my model of what oh, I think awesome. the camera, of what the tower originally looked like. As I said, underneath each of these pillars is three and a half tons of stone, and then you've got these uh, these giant drums, 
and then on, on this ledge was an entablature, and then there'd be these pilasters held on with metal cramp irons, and, and then uh, above that would be another entablature, and then a dome, and on the south side of the dome would be a hole, and inside the dome room would be, ta-da, the camera obscura solar disc calendar room that would keep track of time of day and the day of the year. So this building is a horologium, a building that keeps track of time. And I might say, oh, that's pretty fancy design, Jim. Where do you get that from? Well, D tells us he has two favorite architects, Vitruvius and Leon Battista Alberti. Vitruvius was an architect who lived 25 BC. He wrote 10 books on architecture. When they found his books in the Renaissance, it became the groundwork of Palladio, Leon Battista Alberti, Bramante. They got everything they knew from Vitruvius. And you can still go to Rome today and see Bramante's Tempietto, which is a, a circular temple. And he says they're the most uh, sacred of all buildings. They're usually the two to one design. And sometimes they have a colonnade around them but sometimes they put the columns right on the building. So that's what Dee's work is. And his second favorite architect is Leon Battista Alberti, who not only codified uh, the, the art of perspective, he wrote a book on architecture, 10 books on architecture based on Vitruvius in 1452. And he says lineaments or proportions have nothing to do with the building, with the material that the building is made from. And Dee says, we thank you, Master Alberti, by setting aside the material stuff of the building and appropriately giving your art a mathematical perfection perfection that involves thinking about order, number, form, figure, and symmetry. So you can make this out of field stones if you want. What's important are the proportiones, and the proportions of the tower are, have you figured it out yet? The monad symbol. In other words, the exacting hey. proportions that he uses for the monad symbol are the proportions of the tower. This is the two-to-one proportion right here. And so there are all these other hidden riddles in, in, the, in, the, in the tower. And, and the idea that, uh, that this is a... When I show this to people, I ask them, uh, what does it look like to you? What do you think? I'm open for opinions here. When you see this sigil. It looks like a cyclops with horns. Like a cyclops. Uh-oh, you go right ahead of, ahead of the class. <laughs> <laughs> Most people say that it looks like a stick figure. And, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, but, uh, but uh, if, this is, uh, if this is the head right here, then, uh, then this is the eyeball of the head, and, and, and it is sort of oh, a cyclops. You still with me here? Oh, they were a little bit off there. Let's. Uh, Sorry. There, that's better. Now, okay. did you did you turn your phone, Jim? Yeah, I'm trying to get back on here. Yeah, Let's no, no rush. You're you're allowed to take a breath, though. We we've got all night. We'll we'll hang out the the chat, so you know is just loving this. We've got um people who study uh, Freemasonry, um, esoteric uh, manuscripts, uh, numerology. That's that's the nature of our um, fan base. Is all so we're getting terrific response, and so you're not you're under no pressure to to hurry. I know you're excited, and I love your enthusiasm. Don't misunderstand me, but I want you to know that uh, we're not going to say, well, that's all the time we have. We'll just sit here and keep uh, keep airing this out. We've got a gentleman who's actually close enough by on the eastern seaboard there that he's considering um, maybe coming to visit you. So <clears throat> there you go. Pull him in. I hope to get some interest in it. So. Uh, let's see. Are, are you, can you see me now or not? Um, we're seeing something. I can't quite tell what it is. Because I'm, I'm on low battery power, so I plugged in here, but oh, that, okay. that might be the problem. Yeah. Yeah, that might be it. You're, you're, so we're seeing the uh, the Monas symbol there, so that's that's right in the shot. That looks good. Okay. Uh, I can't see you, but uh, that's as long as, as long as you can see this. Well, anyway, this is uh, kind of a... Uh, it looks like a cyclops, a stick figure. Well, that's exactly what it is. What have we seen today that's like a cyclops? Well, uh, the camera obscura. And that's what D is riddling about. And uh, in his Monas symbol, uh, he, in his geometric description of it, he says this, uh, this point is, uh, is uh, A, B, C, D. He goes through this whole thing. Well, look what he labels this as, point I. The whole thing is a riddle. And D knew that the word cyclops was made from two words, cyclos and ops, circle and I, circle and I. So this is a model of vision, a thing that sees this whole monas is about optics. And it's sort of a, a conglomeration of, uh, of, of, of all these subjects. And let me summarize it for you. In other words, what Buckminster Fuller found out about 
geometry and the union of oppositeness. And what Marshall found out about the union of oppositeness in number, uh, 12 and in, in, uh, in, in, uh, 21 and all of that stuff, and what Penhallow found about the oppositeness in the tower, uh, and well, what I found out about the offices in the camera obscura, that's what the book is about, that's what the tower is about, and that's what the symbol is about. These are all basically the same thing, and this guy was as smart as all of us combined. Why? Because in the Renaissance, they wanted to see how everything was interconnected. And uh, nowadays, you go to college and they say, well, you got to pick a major, and art department's over there, and music's over there, and history's over there. They separate things. So you have to think like a Renaissance person in order to uh, to figure out what John D is talking about. Are you guys still with me? Yeah, absolutely. I think okay. uh, Tra Tracy's private message me that she had to step away for a second, so she may or may not be back. But we're definitely here with you. I'm, I'm <laughs> That's here. okay. I'm just blabbing away here. Hey, uh, specific questions, or you want me to explain a little bit more? I know can you guys hear me at all? Yeah, we can hear you, Tracy. Can you hear her too there, Jim? Yeah, I yeah. Can hear her, yeah. All right. I, yeah, I don't know if you guys explain the situation. Anyway, me, I'm a little bit sensitive, and it only comes up every now and then. Last time I had this happen, it was the Flight 93 movie, and before <laughs> that, Blair Witch. Yeah, I didn't... I didn't happen every few years, but I got sick from watching the bouncing camera. Yeah, I didn't tell him, Tracy. So, yeah, Tracy's <laughs> sensitive, so we know not to have you right in the back of the car then. Yeah. Oh, man. So, I'm sorry, sorry about, that. about that, but, you know, uh, that's why you have to come to the museum to experience the whole thing. <laughs> I'm not, it was really I wasn't good. really seeing the exact framing, so I was kind of guessing that it the whole way. Yeah, but, we're... yeah, we've been bouncing around for an hour. I'd be sick of that, too, but uh, <laughs> maybe you can put some still graphics over it. <laughs> oh, oh, no, geez, it'll, so... be, it'll be great. I mean, we're, we're at the... The fact of the matter is we're doing something that no one, you know, we're, we're following in your footsteps and doing something no one in the world has ever done before, which is a live uh, tour and explanation of your museum. And so regardless of the outcome right this moment, we're like etching something in stone here. As long as we save it and keep it up here, we're recording the whole process so that we've got it on the hard drive. And, um, Excellent. If, yeah, so, share it with the world. Yeah, we will. This will we'll understand it for another fifty years, but uh, they will someday. But uh, it's a very important story, and uh, nobody's ever done it. So you guys are the first people to have a, a, a you know a full tour. I didn't give you the full tour. As you can see, I could bore people for an hour. But uh, you know, when people come in here, I uh, I judge whether they're going to be interested in the, the full hour tour or if it's just going to be they want to see uh, fifteen minutes and then go to the mansions, uh, at Newport mansions and stuff. But there's a uh, there's a lot more to this, and uh, that's what my books are about. Uh, I just wanted to show you one more thing here. In this uh, in this uh, drawing of uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the front cover of General and Rare Memorials, there uh, there are clues as to you see. How can I put this? The Spanish ambassador told Walsingham as soon as they found out where this colony was going to be, the Spanish. They would slit the throats of every man, woman, and child in the colony, just like they did the Rabot colony in Florida, which was the French colony in Jacksonville. They killed 102 people, slaughtered man, woman, and child. So they had to write cryptically about it. D had to write cryptically about it. So he had a secret code word and a secret code symbol for the mission of 1583. The secret code, the secret code, a word for the mission uh, was the slogan, sort of was the anchor of hope. Oh, yes. And the secret code word for the mission was, you want to take a guess? No. Hmm. No. <laughs> Rhode, the very name of our state, R-O-D-E. Oh, oh and interesting. And so D okay. uh, hid these things. And, and what I wanted to explain was that uh, nowadays, uh, you can see uh, our flag. This is uh, the Rhode Island state flag. It has the uh, the anchor on it, and there's hope. The anchor of hope is our state slogan, and we were the last ones to join the union. That's why they have the 13 uh, stars around it. And, and, but it was adopted by the first governor of Rhode Island, Benedict Arnold, in, uh, in 1663. There you see his initials, B.A., and there's the hope and the whole thing. And uh, the idea of hope uh, comes from uh, uh, the Bible, uh, Hebrews chapter 6, hope is the anchor for the soul. And so it's a theological thing, and Dee wasn't the first one to use it, but 
uh, that uh, it, uh, it they they uh, in the Bible uh, the the, uh, the persecuted Christians <coughs> in Rome they would have what's called a Cairo cross, which I don't know if you see it right here. It has a PX Cairo, and underneath it you see the anchor. It's yeah. called an anchor of hope cross. Well, on the front cover of uh, the of the book here. Look what you see right on Queen Elizabeth's the top of her mast, the Anchor of Hope crosses. And uh, if you take this uh, uh, a close up of the uh, of the of the ship here, you'll see the giant anchor right there on the on the ship. And uh, there are all of these clues about uh, the Anchor of Hope. If you take these words, uh, this word right up on the top, which is part of hieroglyphicon, the word, and take that letter and that letter and combine them to make an H, you have H-O-P-E right there on the top. And, and, uh, and if uh, this tetrahedron is seen as a triangle, which Tracy observantly uh, said earlier, well, that represents a triangular island that should be out here in the mouth of the bay, which is the D River, and D nicknames himself the Triangle. He signs his name over a thousand times in his book with an equilateral triangle, calling it the fourth letter. He calls himself the fourth letter. Anyway, uh, if you take uh, uh, that triangle there, and, and in Greek, uh, P is an R, R-O-D-E. It spells road right there. It spells road and hope. He was so clever. And, and uh, in, uh, in, in nautical terms, uh, a bunch of ships that are coming into a safe harbor, they say they're at road, which means they're at, at, at safety here. And, and uh, uh, up on the top here, you'll see these, uh, these roses, which is a symbol of the Tudor reign. Uh, so you got ro in, in Greek, road means rose. That's the symbol of the Tudor reign. So uh, what I really wanted to show you was that my friend just created this artwork for me. And uh, it describes uh, this, uh, this uh, brooch, which is uh, a, a necklace that Sir Humphrey Gilbert received from Queen Elizabeth just before he left. And uh, it's written about, it's, it's, no, it, it's, it's no longer because it was around his neck probably when he drowned. But I'll read it to you. As a token of her special favor, the Queen gave Sir Humphrey a very excellent jewel, the portrait of a queen holding an anchor of gold set with 29 diamonds. There's the 29 diamonds. On her breast is a large pointed diamond, and on the flukes of the anchors are large pearls. The chain is decorated with roses, roses like the road, and uh, it attaches a silk scarf with gold and silver. And on the back side, it's written, Tumor sub sacra ancora, be safeguarded by the sacred anchor. The anchor of hope and a road, there they are. He put them right on this emblem that he had, and uh, D put them right on the chart and the whole thing. So, you know, people have known about this voyage. Isn't in 1582, Richard Hackloyd, he was uh, a, a friend of D's. He writes all about the, the voyage, and he, and he talks about it. This says uh, uh, parallel with Rome, uh, 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 the, the opus of the south, and then it goes 12 leagues and the five small islands. And right there in the margin, he says the country of Sir Humphrey Gilbert's voyage. I don't know if you can see that. He says it right there. Everybody, anybody reading this book and anybody in England would know that that's, this is exactly where it was, the country of Sir Humphrey Gilbert's voyage. So all this stuff has been known about, but nobody ever sort of pieced it together that, uh, that it's an important story, not of only about the history of Newport and Rhode Island, but the history of America. This is where it all started. So uh, I'm trying to convince you know, local people to be interested in it. I have even made up these... these uh, stickers that says Rhode Island is first and the whole thing and I get so excited about it I wrote these eight books and then I couldn't get anyone to read the eight books so I summarize it in this one book called Elizabethan America that I sell for, for, on, on, uh, on Amazon.com and it explains everything that I explained to you tonight plus much much more and then every year since then I've been writing uh, another book and and uh, uh, some of the books include the uh, uh, clues that I found. Uh, in other words, I, I actually show you prints of where I found all of these clues. This one's called John D's America. This one's about 600 pages long. It has more about maps and charts, more detailed about, about uh, D's. Uh, uh, I, I call it the idea of America came from the mind of John D. And then uh, this is the, uh, the works of John D, my translations and, and transliterations from uh, Elizabethan England. This is about Newport in the 1800s and how they loved the tower and then why they put it on the Newport city flag and, uh, and various ones about geometry and such. And 
So I've had this museum for about eight years now. I've had 8,000 people from all over the world, people from all over every country of Europe, every city, every state in America has been here. But very few Rhode Islanders come. So if any Rhode Islanders out there, come on over. And you can also buy my latest product here is the Tower Shot Glass. <laughs> yeah. The tower, the tower Mug, the Tower Cozy, the Tower in a Can, and, and, and uh, the Tower Christmas uh, Ornament here. I'm having too much fun with it and postcards and the whole thing. So that's a pretty general summary of what's going on. I'm sorry it made you sick, Tracy, but, oh. you know, I do that to people. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we, we're loving this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing stuff that you've, uh, you've told us. And really, you know, even though you've only summarized it here, I think you've made your case certainly about John D and his involvement with that area and that tower. And I'm kind of surprised that you would get any resistance really at this point because you laid it out very well. So it's, I mean, they obviously you showed us the paper where it said that that river is named after him. It's, it's pretty much open and shut case here, I think. So uh, that, I that was my question. That was the one question that keeps popping into my mind here is um, have they actually come out and tried to poke holes in and or criticize or disagree with your theory or have they just been using what we call um, dynamic silence usually when someone's right and they don't really want to address it that's the term i've found uh that that applies that they just kind of there's like a subtle passive agreement between scholars and other high ups and they just choose not to really talk about it or address it so have, do you have like a Someone who said, oh, no, here's why Jim Egan's wrong, or, or not, Jim? No, and in fact, I love that term, dynamic silence. That's pretty much basically what it is. They kind of just basically ignore me. You see, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I've only lived in town here for about eight, eight years, and uh, I actually live in Jamestown now, but I've been had this museum for about eight years, so I'm kind of new, and Newport's kind of an old town, and, and People have kind of made up their mind about the tower. Oh, my grandmother said it was built by the Vikings, so we, I think it was built by the Vikings. You call my grandmother a liar? You know? <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, a lot of people tell me, oh, we like it as a mystery. We'd rather remain a mystery. I'm like, what if this story is much more interesting than a mystery? Right. And so, uh, uh, and then the, the, the other, the, the people who are uh, uh, down, you know, some of the historians around, they say, hey, look, we have uh, an original document by the first governor, and he says that it's a windmill. Huh. What better evidence is that than, than that? And they don't even want to listen to my story. So, uh, the, you know, it takes a while to move people. I was shocked. I figured people would really get it, and it'd be a large bandwagon, but it's been an uphill battle for many years, and it will continue to be. I don't think that I'll be famous till 50 years after I'm dead, but... It's a very important story, and, you know, I want to share it with the world. Part of the reason is, uh, you know, this was Dee's dream. He wanted to settle the battles between Catholicism and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and Protestantism that had, had wrenched England and all of Europe. And this was to be the, uh, the utopia. This was to be, uh, in fact, uh, when Sir Vigo were drowned, uh, the, his, the guy that, that, that was on the, the old sole surviving ship, he said he was holding a book. And his last sentence was, I am no, longer, I am no, I, I'm no nearer to, to heaven by land than I am by sea. And that was a quote from Sir Thomas More's Utopia. Sir Thomas More lived in the early 1500s, and he was beheaded by the king, so he wasn't very popular. But he wrote this book called Utopia about this incredible land that everybody was free and they all worked loving jobs and everybody, there was no religion fighting, there was anything. And so that's what Dee was dreaming of and that's what Gilbert was uh, dreaming of and that's what uh, the first governor of Rhode Island uh, uh, and also the people who came to Rhode Island uh, uh, wanted, that was their dream as well. You see, uh, uh, most of the other colonies, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, they were all run by the church. But in Rhode Island was the first place where there was freedom of religion. And in 1663, uh, we got the first uh, uh, a proclamation from the king that this was to be a place where you could worship as you please. And so the Quakers came, the Jews, the Sabbatarians. We have the first Quaker meeting house, the first 
uh, the Jewish synagogue in America is here, and, and uh, the Sabbatarians and the ranters, the ra all these groups were allowed to come here. They called it the sewer of New England. The people of Boston hated us because we let in all of these people uh, here in Newport. So this became the place where there was freedom of religion. And so uh, on the eastern seaboard, there were five major cities, Boston, Newport, uh, New York, Charleston, South Carolina, and Philadelphia. Well, in the Revolutionary War, when all of these, the, the, the Americans were fighting these taxes and such, they decided to take over one of the five cities. What did they take over? Newport. Why? The biggest rabble rousers were here. And they, they occupied the city for three years, and they trashed the place. They lived in the building next door. They lived in one of those buildings. The building next door, they would burn it. And, and so they burned half the city. Half the population left and never returned. And they stored the gunpowder in the pot in the tower. And when they left, they lit it because so the Americans wouldn't get it. And boom, it blew the top off the tower. That's when the wood got compromised and it later all rotted and the top was gone. It's amazing the thing still stands. It withstood, uh, you know, uh, all that explosion. But the point is, after the war, 12 of the 13 colonies uh, formed a union. And Rhode Island said, we're not joining because you didn't put in anything about freedom of religion. You didn't, they didn't put anything about freedom of speech in there. We've already got these freedoms here. We're not joining. So Washington was present for a year and a half before Rhode Island finally joined, and it was only by a vote of 30, uh, 34 to 32, by, by a slim margin. And Washington was so appreciative, he got on a horse and rode up to Rhode Island, and he gave a very famous speech at the, at the Toro Synagogue, which is just down the street here. And so Rhode Island it became, was this place where, uh, in, in other words, we insisted that the Bill of Rights be amended to the Constitution before we signed on. And, they agreed to that. So this, these freedoms that we have came from Rhode Island. And so uh, you know, it's a very important story because America is a beacon of freedom for... Oh, we might have lost him there, folks. We'll see. Jim, if you can hear us, your phone just jumped only to your icon and we can no longer hear your audio. Um... You know, I know that uh, he said that he had done his best to charge his phone up. So maybe what I'm going to do right now while we're waiting is uh, I think I'm going to go and try and email him the link because he said he could potentially um, sit down at his desktop if need be. Because I know even if your phone's almost dead and you plug it in, it'll still last. But your uh, charger typically will not keep up with the rate at which audio and video combined are going to drain down your battery so please bear with me uh, you want to kind of can you can you talk to the chat or something long enough for me to grab it and get get an email up here jim yeah are you, are you still here tracy i am here yes what is that a do-rag on Sh sean's head what up what up <laughs> i'm giving up hats for lint <laughs> uh, you know, I was thinking about uh, about uh, Mr. Egan there, and that if he wants to get the attention of academia, he probably should try to relate this story somehow to gender studies or uh, global warming, or I mean, climate change, and maybe he could get get one of his papers in an academic journal then, and because I I don't know if you've seen the the uh, the news about the. Um, I, I guess you would call it an academic hoax that was pulled off. Yeah, you should tell that story, Tracy, just in case people in the chat didn't catch it when you posted it on Twitter. You should, because uh, it's it's like Portland University or something, isn't it? Like right down the street yeah. from you. Yeah. Well, yeah. The professors that started it are, are from PSU, and basically, from my recollection, they wrote a paper about I don't know. They were studying d dog genitals and somehow that it had something to do with feminism and uh man i need to get the details here but but anyway the point is that they wrote something that was supposed to be ridiculous but because they related it somehow to gender studies they were able to get it into all of these academic journals and it was highly praised before someone figured out that it was actually a joke and then uh, I don't think they got fired, but they're be the professors that that came up with the hoax are being threatened to be fired, and they're very much being vilified by 
all yeah, the that was teachers. to me that was the most shocking thing was that they got hoaxed and they didn't like be embarrassed and like kind of put their tail between their legs. Instead, they're like, "You dirty bastards are hoaxing us." And this is too serious for you to be making jokes and making fun of us. And they, like, tried to turn it around and, like, lambaste them. Like, you guys are the ones that reviewed an article about, like, what was it, milking? No, it was examining dogs' genitals. And they, they claimed that they had examined just less than 10,000 dogs' genitals. <laughs> and go ahead, Tracy. Oh, no, I just, okay, so it had something to do with uh, dog humping incidents at dog parks can be taken as evidence of rape culture. And then, yeah, the evidence, <laughs> some, some of the evidence they brought in was the many thousands of dog genitals that they had examined. I, I mean, I would love to see the whole piece, you know, because these are just, these are snippets of it. Uh, oh, another, another the, the, that was just one of the papers, though, because apparently there were others, and one of them had a section of Mein Kampf that had been rewritten as intersectional feminism. I don't even know what intersectional feminism is, but oh, apparently... I, I don't know if I could... Uh, I don't know if I could define it while I'm still trying to send Jim an email. But... <laughs> Someone in the chat, please define intersectional feminism or at least go to the Urban Dictionary and uh, copy-paste for us so we could read it aloud during this live broadcast. Thank you. It, yeah, so the intersectional rape culture, dog, dog humping oh, incidents at parks. Yeah, Jim's got it for us. Go ahead, Jim. The concept of intersectionality is intended to illuminate dynamics that have often been overlooked by feminist movements and theory. As articulated by author Bell Hooks, the emergence of intersectionality challenged the notion that gender was the primary factor in determining a woman's fate. That's okay. what. Uh, not the, sure the Google I, said. Do I, do I understand it better now yeah. or, <laughs> or, or not? Is... Uh, intersectionality considers the various forms of social stratification, such as class, race, sexual orientation, age, religion, creed, disability, and gender, do not exist separately from each other but are interwoven together. While the theory began as an exploration of the oppression of women of color within society, Today, the analysis is potentially applied to all social categories, including social identities usually seen as dominant when censored independently. Or, I'm sorry, dominant when considered independently. Okay. Well, I, I think uh, the, the professors that did this hoax, they said they were motivated by the fact that they were seeing so many articles in academic journals that were relating things that one would think of as a hard science to, uh, you know, to feminism and gender studies and, and uh, things like that, and interpreting scientific data as being, you know, racist or homophobic or things like that, which one strains the mind to imagine how that how that can be. <laughs> so I saw a, a clip of someone, I guess, doing a TED talk where they she was talking about uh, what do you would call it? Uh, some kind of gla glaciers that were anti-female or something. I mean, what's the term? <laughs> yeah, yeah anti-feminist uh, glaciers. Misogynistic so, or no? Yeah, male the. I remember that one now. Yeah, male-dominated scientists, or it was a male-dominated dom field. The scientists had studied the glaciers, and they put a uh, a telephone under a glacier so that you could call a, a phone number and and listen to the glacier sounds. That was a oh wow the. <laughs> The, the feminist so, way the, to... I wanted study. to point something out. My that my email was lagging really hard in the browser, so I'm trying again. Um, I really want to get Jim back. I told him we had this planned in advance just in case this happened, so we should be able to get him back, hopefully. Um, Do you want me to call him? Well, that's not a bad idea. Um, you, will your setup just grab him onto the line? Will he, will he just come through on your side and we'll be able to hear you guys' conversation like speaker, phone, or...? 
No, I'm not saying that. I mean, I'm just saying, do you want me to call him and find out what's up? Yeah, you can call him and at least get a confirmation that he wants to pop back up if I can get him the link. Sure, absolutely. Let's do that. All right. And, uh, the I'll, other... I'll call him and just find out if he's coming back or not. Cool. The, the other thing right. I wanted to say about the article, and we'll post it in the Discord, uh, the people who did it are all leftists. They're not like conservative uh, Trump trolls or something. These are all people that have become disenfranchised to some degree and disenchanted with the severity that the the path of the left has taken. So they, because I'm sure they feel most attacked, because they're you know obviously if you're in high up academia and you're on the left or right, you have like you have a goal and an outcome for what your work is pointed at, and if all of a sudden it all goes to hell. Then you, there's some pushback, you know, like, hey, whoa, everybody, let's come back towards the center a little bit. You know, we're going nuts here. And if you're not seeing results, then you start to become jaded and be like, all right, well, how about we examine dog genitals and prove that it means everybody's rapey? Three, two, one, go. <laughs> oh, look, you approved us because that's what you, you're, you know, it's such an echo chamber. Uh-oh. Oh. oh. Sorry, I was actually, I, I just was saying, I'm going to get rid of my video for a minute while I do this. Okay. And my audio. I'll be, I'll be back in a moment. Oh, uh, by the way, folks, I did post, um, I posted uh, updated information in the description of this show. I posted uh, Jim Egan's Amazon.com page so that you can go there. I recently, um, just yesterday, paid the 30 bucks or whatever it is to buy the Elizabethan America book because uh, that's the summary. I will definitely be buying at some point in time his translation of all of John Dee's works because I would say that's like quintessential publication. Ha <laughs> ha That's Tracy's <laughs> old publishing company. Um, but uh, I know that he includes the Latin and the English and um, I'm, really, I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, I guess... The truth is, if we can't get him back on tonight, we can definitely um, continue on and read the chat and discuss. There was so much information that he presented it so fast that I think most of us um, just kind of underwater with it, you know, like, oh, yeah. and um, so if we can't get him back, of course, we could follow up with him and say, look, we want to do this again. You know, maybe, uh, who knows, maybe we'll have a daytime episode where he can go over to the tower during the day. Who knows? You know, I'll kind of see the camera obscura live. That would be cool. Tell him he can get a little bit more prepped and get his uh, cell phone on a tripod so that, uh, you know, it's not quite as uh, wiggly. Because he's a professional photographer. I'm sure he could do all that. So. Hey. What's up? So he said we could call him back and just wrap it up, you know? Okay. So I'm... So I'm I'm having a little bit of trouble uh, with the browser, so I'm just trying to... I'm going to my sent messages where I know I sent Jim the link earlier. This Jim. And, um... So I should be able to... forward it that way. I, I really hate that, uh... Tracy, is it possible for you to email me the link? Is it easy right in front of you that you... Cause it won't let me copy paste with my phone on Twitter private messages. Uh, it probably is if I can remember what your email address is. Um, I'll put it in the side chat because that's the <laughs> one I use all the time. You know, not that I don't trust and love you guys, but there is such things as the real trolls in the world, and I get enough spam. So okay. It's almost there. Plus, if I say my real email, I'll totally date myself. <laughs> oh, there he is. He's We're back. back. All oh. right. Jim, welcome back. Exactly what we predicted might happen did happen, and the browser was lagging so hard I couldn't get an email to you to jump to your desktop. So. Okay. Well, I apologize. I ran out of battery power on my end, so I, I'm plugged in now so we can chat. Yeah, we're glad to have you back, and we've got plenty of time. So let's uh, let's take it easy and do some Q and A or whatever. Uh, I'm not sure if I remember where we left off, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. I know someone asked uh, how tall the tower was. It's 28 feet tall right now, from the ground up to the top. Uh, but I think it was originally 36 feet high, 
and had a, 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 that 12 foot dome on it, so it was 48 feet high. Uh, and it, it holds the proportions of one to two, two to three, and three to four, very important harmonic proportions uh, that uh, the D knew about. E. Um, anyone else have a uh, specific yeah, question? Yeah, we could, uh, Jim, did you catch any questions in the chat? Folks, right now is a great time to type uh, questions, any questions you might have for Jim Egan. Um, let's see, I had a, now let me, I'm going to reiterate something you said. You said that 108 is like the most sacred and mystical number in, uh, in many Eastern traditions, and that they, you, you considered 252 to be the... Um, sacred number of the West, and that they complete the circle if you add them together. Was that right? Yes, 252 and 108. Yep. So that's 360 degrees. Yeah, there's 108 uh, uh, beads on the mala, and uh, I just ordered one, and they all have 108 on it. And uh, and I, I asked the lady uh, if she would make me one with 252 on it, so I'm going to have two, two malas. Cool. <laughs> but uh, the traditional one is 108. There's 108 verses in the Rig Veda. 108 is very integral to their calendar system. The long range, which deals with epics, uh, uh, 108, uh, 216, and 300, uh, 432. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you can Google it. If you go to Delhi today, you pay an extra $1,000 to have 108 on your uh, cell phone number. It's, like, ultra special. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing about uh, epics, the... It's the number of uh, of suitors that Penelope had in uh, the Odyssey. Interesting. Huh. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. I so I also wanted to point out that they both reduced numerologically to nine. Now, when I listened to your other broadcast, Jim, you used a special word for that, uh, a mathematical word for that reduction of numbers, and I wanted to remember that, too. Oh, the, yeah, the numbers indig. Uh, indigging is, is the phrase that Buckminster Fuller, when you add the digits... Uh, they add to nine. And actually, any uh, number that's a multiple of nine, uh, if you indig it, the digits will always add to nine. 18, 18, 27, 36, all these, they always add to nine. But uh, any number, no matter how, how you go, it's always divisible by nine. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's one of the important uh, stories in uh, what D calls consumata, which means to make perfect. So, but I don't want to explain the whole thing here. I, I really make everybody throw up. <laughs> um, well, uh, we're getting uh, requests for you to definitely be a return guest, and someone is saying, uh, "Where did I see there?" Someone this... wanted to know a bit more about the lost Jew thing. Yeah, yeah, that was the one I was trying to get to. The lost what? The lost Jew. I, I'm not sure if I remember that part of the story. So, was there a lost Jew thing? I was out of the room, so I don't know. The lost Jew, jewel. <laughs> Jewel. Oh no, I understand. Okay, they're they're asking about the theory that um, the Native Americans are actually the lost tribe of Israel, and that that was part of the the British uh, mission uh, to come over here, convert the um, Native Americans, and potentially bring um, the return of Christ. I remember that being. We were talking about that in the side chat. Oh, it looks like we might be getting some lag here. We might have lost him again, folks. Hey, Jim. <laughs> oh. Uh -oh. Yeah, his, if he's still on his phone, I'm going to keep trying to get the... There's got to be a way I can get that to send. Because if he wants to go sit at his desktop, we can, we can dra get him back in that way. But that phone, it, it drags so much... Um, power for audio and video at the same time it's just okay so i was trying to get see if i can do this again or not someone says columbus is believed to be a crypto semite crypto yeah i've semite. i've heard that theory before mm. the well, I know, I know there was a whole bunch of crypto Jews in South America, and they called them Muranos. I don't remember the full details of the story, but I know that that was definitely um, part of the history of South America. Now, the but I think I think what James Egan was saying, like in uh, the 
previous interview I did with him when he mentions this uh, lost tribe of Israel theory that he was saying was quite popular during that time and it was pretty much the predominant belief amongst Christians in Britain was that the, I think his point was just they're uh, preoccupied with um, converting the Indians and with uh, you know actualizing some kind of prophesized destiny and that 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 was the climate that uh, Elizabeth and John D were working under you know that they may have been involved in something more mystical you know a more kind of mystically uh, motivated plot and they couldn't really tell everybody the details of what they were thinking because everybody else was more of uh, you know I guess what would be called now a fundamentalist Christian and uh, would it, you know if he's saying that he thinks uh, you know people would have been possibly persecuted for using a camera obscura then you can imagine uh, that a lot of the things that he was talking about here are, are things that you just wouldn't talk about with you know normal people back then yeah I, I definitely wanted to um, drag that portion of the um, the, the topic in and I, and I just didn't I, I tried to interrupt him at one point but uh, the idea that we don't really deal in we don't encode things like all of the old texts do and it's all of them across the board they all like what what do they call it when the writing is um, paralleling each other on two sides of the page it's almost forward and backwards there's a name for that um, I can't remember it right off the top of my head it's like palindrome oh, what was that Tracy uh, are you talking about when it zigzags the, when the text goes right to left and then left to right yeah yeah I think it's called booster feed on so I'm back again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome back, Jim. I, sorry, uh, I got plugged in here, but maybe it wasn't charging, or maybe it's yes. Not handling, but. Sometimes the 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 draw on the phone will just overrun the amount of charge that your charger can push. So I'm what I'm trying to I do is send yeah. you an email right now with the link, just in case it happens again. You said you had a desktop. My, my, oh, I can go link to the desktop. Okay. So I'm trying to get it in an email. It's just taking forever because I think this computer is uh, it's cursing me a little bit. <laughs> That's okay. Tech, tech uh, happens. Did you put the your email address in the in the chat there? I did, but I got the link, yeah. Tracy. So oh, I, yeah. I, should, I should be okay. I'll let you know. But yeah, um, Jim, we were just discussing how. Uh, how we know that there's probably at least some doubt uh, in the way that you present your theories because of the fact that people fail to understand how encoded, encrypted, and obsessed with riddles they were in the past, partly because of just the fun of it or the nature of making things mean more than one thing, but also because of the, the danger. You know, if you're making a camera obscura and you think it's going to cost you your life, then you'll probably find a way to not be real obvious when you're writing it in a letter being sent across the sea or something. So. Yeah, actually, both of those things. Yeah, there's a, there's a very special book. Let me see if I can grab it. Maybe. I want to show you this. This is a great book. <laughs> Okay, looks like it should Sorry. be sent. Sorry, uh, this is a really special book that I, I really enjoyed reading. It's called uh, Elizabethan Silent Language. And it is all about uh, the, in, you know, crypto, we upside down here. Elizabethan <laughs> Silent Language. And uh, it's written by this woman, uh, Mary Hazard. And it's all about how they made riddles back then in, uh, in, the, in, in, in Dee's time. And it was all about... Uh, uh, the cryptic codes in emblems and everything they that they love doing that we don't do that anymore we don't tell riddles riddles we consider child's play and oh they don't don't you know they don't do that anymore so you know we have to think in terms of, of what these Elizabethans thought like and I mean look at Shakespeare he's filled with riddles and dirty jokes and all of this double entendres and such right it's all the same thing. So, yeah, that's a very important aspect. And that's why people don't understand it. I happen to be a riddler, and I happen to understand, uh, you know, I like riddles, and I like jokes. That's why I'm like, oh, here's what Dee is saying. He makes sense to me. But academics particularly, they don't do riddles. We're too serious for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
we're going into another time period here where people are looking at such things with suspicion and it's somewhat of a similar reason but it, it's really because people are waking up to how much of this there is and some of it being you know having its roots in secret societies some of which have had you know what some people would consider a malignant influence on on history and yep. on the government and so yeah we're in a time period where a lot of people look askance at any use of a cryptic language because they just think oh that's illuminati stuff and it must have some kind of uh, bad undertone to it you know there's some, right. something evil that they're encoding in there and probably most of the time that's not the case although sometimes it is but uh yeah i think that that's uh that's a, an interesting parallel that we have in our own time here no, it's a very good observation, and it's a thing of our times where we have to, have to under, you understand it in, in veiled language, especially nowadays when sometimes our politicians aren't saying the things that they really mean, for example, right. <laughs> all over, every day, you know, in the news. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not a conspiracy guy. I'm not all into all these conspiracy things. I'm a historian, I'm, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, an amateur academic. I'm not an academic. I don't have a Ph.D., as I said, but... Um, but uh, I am able to understand what D says and understand his riddles and his puzzles. And it's like, you know, almost like he's talking to me because a part of it is uh, I translated his books from Latin into English. And when you, when you go through that and really understand the, the words and the phrases and, and how the illustrations relate to the words, and being a professional photographer, I'm able to think visually and graphically, and, and that's what Dee did. He had that kind of a mind that thought visually and graphically. So uh, all of this stuff, you know, I'm like, oh, I get where he's, and I know that he's riddling. Everything that he did is a giant riddle, you know? Mm -hmm. he, and he was so clever at it, and it's just, uh, it just, uh, it just amazes me more and more. I'm working on another book now. It's over a thousand pages long. Uh, more about the Monas hieroglyphica. Yeah, I mean, the depth of the riddling in there is just unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> How many books do you have? I mean, I I was counting. I don't ever think I got to the end of it because I I was trying to put some links to uh, some of your books in in the description of one of the videos I did. And yeah, at a certain point, I just I just gave up. I I only listed a few <laughs> of them. <laughs> well, thank you. You got the main ones. By the way, that video came out great. I looked at it by, last night, and you know. Uh, except for the subject, me. <laughs> you know, but no, it was just great. And uh, but uh, I love the way you you put visuals over all of the all of the stuff. So um, very well done. Uh, I've written twenty books, and uh, I'm working on uh, sort of this is going to be it's sort of th three books that I'm working on at once now. Uh, nobody wants to read a thousand page book, but uh, uh, you know, over the last ten years, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe maybe uh, fifteen years, I've written twenty books. And I self-publish them, and you can go to uh, Amazon and type in James Allen Egan, A-L-A-N, E-G-A-N, uh, James Allen Egan, and, uh, and they should all pop up. And, yeah, I've uh, got the, the link is in the description for anybody that wants to buy the books. Um, and I just, uh, I just purchased uh, my, my first James Allen Egan book yesterday. I grabbed the Elizabethan... Uh, America book and I, I I just said this while you were gone Jim but I definitely uh, encourage people to check it out pick one buy one so that you have a hard copy at home and uh, I love that you translated all the John D stuff eventually I will definitely come fire the button for buy one more time to get all of that and have a hard copy in my library so, so yeah 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 what do you mean hard copy he just means a printed version it's not a hardcover book right and uh, uh, but Elizabeth in America is the first one people should buy. You bought the right one. That's a good starter book. It summarizes everything. Right. And the rest of it tangentialized from there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so someone brought up the um, the Shakespeare stuff again in the in the chat here, and that reminded me. Yeah, that's uh, definitely another uh, book of yours that people ought to get. Is the one about uh, Shakespeare and um, John Dee possibly collaborating. Because I just thought that was another amazing thing that you've discovered, and it fits right in with him being the guy that you know came up with the idea of America, and that we're living in his new world now. Well, we're also speaking uh, uh, English that is largely uh, influenced by Shakespearean English, 
and he had something to do with that, according to you. So would you mind? I, we're almost at the end here. I'm sure I, you probably want to go to bed or something. But uh, can you just? No, I'm okay. I'm a little, little thumbnail fine. there. I can talk forever because we discussed it a little bit on the other uh, video. You know, I, I, Shakespeare coined over uh, 250 words, new words in the English language. John D. coined 144 words. A lot of them were Latin and uh, French and Italian words that, that were he used for the first time in uh, in uh, in English. But uh, they were both wordsmiths and. Uh, and I think they were no, great friends. And you can go to any uh, encyclopedia and look up uh, The Tempest, and you'll see the character Prospero. Everybody says it was modeled after John Dee, you know, with, with the, his, his magical books and the magic stuff. And, and so uh, I think, you know, uh, Newport, I mean, uh, London was not that big a place. Uh, they are great friends. They know each other. You know, whoever Shakespeare is, I won't to get into that whole uh, debate right now, but... Um, uh, once I started reading and reread The Tempest, and then I went to see the play, and, and uh, I'm, I'm like, oh my God, this is a whole, you know, uh, it's a reflection on, the, on, on this whole colonization effort. And in other words, uh, Shakespeare commemorated most of the other kings, you know, Richard the First, Richard the Second, all of these kings in, in uh, King John, but he didn't really write about the, the queen who was queen when he was there. Well, part of it was. You don't want to take chances, a little risky. So, so, uh, but uh, I claim that that's what this is about. The Tempest was commemoration of one of the greatest events that happened in Elizabethan history. It didn't work out, but it eventually worked out. And uh, and and the whole idea of new worlds and and uh, there are all sorts of hidden clues in there. I don't know if you know. Uh, 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 Prospero sends Ariel one night out to to fly down to the Bermuths. And Bermuth uh, is uh, is it was the Elizabethan term for Bermuda, and just uh, uh, offshore wow. from Newport, if you head south here, uh, is Bermuda. And so, uh, uh, in fact, every year they have a Newport to Bermuda uh, uh, sailboat race. And so there are all these clues. In fact, I told you about the Anchor of Hope, and uh, and uh, and uh, the idea that uh, Rose or Road was the uh, was the clue. Well. The word Prospero, in it you can find the word rose, R-O-S-E, and the word Spero, S-P-E-R-O, in Latin means hope. The, 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 the very name has rose and hope, and that's, that's brilliant. And wow. Miranda, who is his daughter, uh, Miranda, you know what that means in, in Italian or in Latin? No. Watchtower. Wow, oh, really? Hello. I was blown away. I looked it up. I'm like, holy shit. And so <laughs> here's his... His, you know the watch down the whole thing and then and so uh, I, 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 I being familiar with all the characters in the Elizabethan colonization effort I was able to associate each character with uh, with a different uh, a person in the uh, in the in the tempest and they're all riddles about that Elizabethan people would have gotten because they knew these characters and and so the uh, elite that he was writing for would understand all this double entendre but you know, the, the, the people down, uh, you know, the, you know, what do they call them, the underlings, the people, that, the groundlings, whatever, they wouldn't get it. And people who didn't understand this colonization wouldn't get it. And if you don't understand, if you haven't read Elizabethan America, you'll think that I'm bonkers. But once you do read it and understand uh, the, uh, what this was all about and how they hit riddles, uh, you'll see that it makes perfect sense. And so I just was so excited about it every time I turned around. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know the play, but um, the, the, the ship, uh, you know, the, she, he, ma he makes this, uh, this, this giant tempest, and the ship gets shipwrecked up on the island, right? Are you familiar with the play? A little bit. I, yeah. yeah I anyway, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the group of people that were on the, island, uh, on the, on the ship that he, that he seen were, were the people who had usurped his throne. He used to be the king of... of uh, of Naples, and so uh, and Prospero did. So he he gets them in, and and uh, and and they all uh, get washed up on the shore, but in three different groups. And uh, one uh, one group is is two guys. One's a drunk guy, and and uh, and, uh, and his friend, and then <clears throat> the single guy, Ferdinand. He's the the son. He gets a fish out, and and then the, all of the king and all of the men. They they're the third group. Well, if you got three shores and an island, what's the shape of the island? Well, it's triangular, which is like uh, the triangular island at the mouth of the river, which D is calls his name the triangular island. That's his his name. He calls himself the triangle, and he signs his name over a thousand times with the triangular. So, the whole island is triangular anyway. 
uh, as Prospero gets all of them, they eventually all make it to the center of the island, and uh, and he forgives them all. That's what the whole thing is all about, and it's supposedly his swan song, uh, his final uh, his final thing. But I claim uh, in the, in the middle of the island is the tower, and the tower is representative this tower here and in other words that was where a prospero and his daughter lived for 14 years anyway mm -hmm. uh, it's a much longer book i don't expect you to believe it just on me talking about it but um uh, but uh that's a very important thing and, and and if there's a connection there there's probably other connections as well Stay you, you you had us at well, you had us at d that's the truth <laughs> <laughs> okay so this is doesn't this sound very similar to there's another story i've heard about John D. And I, I can only remember a little bit of it, but basically it was that the defeat of the Spanish Armada with a, with a storm was something that he had caused by doing magic. Have you heard this? Yeah, no, I've heard that, you know, but he was in Prague at the time. He wasn't even, you know, near, uh, near London at all, but, uh, but it's magic. It is kind of magic, you know, and so, so he, I mean, you know, he, he could have, he could have been talking. Yeah. And, but, uh, but I, you know, I don't, uh, you know, see any, uh, any, any. Uh, I don't see why it couldn't be possible. But uh, I don't see, I, I'm, you know, I haven't included any of that stuff in my book because uh, he was kind of far away. He was out of favor with the queen, but, uh, but he was also John D. You know, and right. and something very special. But I will say that uh, uh, the uh, the Elizabethans would not have won that battle if it hadn't been for John D. Because he was the one that convinced the queen build a navy of 60 to 80 large ships and if they hadn't built that they wouldn't have had all this protection to get this stuff done so uh, Good point. Uh, yes. and uh, and uh, you know part of the reason why the colony in raw in, uh, in North Carolina failed was that uh, uh, they sent over the colonists and uh, and, and then John White one of these guys uh, said well I'm going back to England and I'm come coming back with supplies well when he got back to England the Queen said no ships are going to leave anymore uh, because the Spanish are going to attack at any time. And they weren't able to go back for like three or four years. And the people there, they ended up starving. When they did finally go back, uh, they all they found was a post that had the word Croatoan on it. And, and the, the colony had been, been lost. And that's why they called it the lost colony. So, uh, you know, all of this stuff is really integral to, uh, to American history. Have you do decoded Croatoan yet? Because that's the sort of thing you would do, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I haven't got to that one yet, no, but I did go down and visit the, uh, the island down there, Roanoke Island, and uh, took the tour of it. They have this huge uh, amphitheater, and since 1939, they've been putting on this stage performance with Elizabeth and Raleigh and the whole thing, and, uh, you know, it's, it's huge. They, they really love Elizabethan history down there, and They've got an Elizabethan garden you can walk through, and you can see the old site, which not, not, there's not much there. But here, there's a building that still exists. It's right there, and it, nobody cares. I just blows my mind away. I can't <laughs> believe I've, I didn't learn anything about John D until I started learning about occultism, you know, when I was a, a teenager. But, you know, I went yep. through all that inf uh, learning about American history and stuff, and nobody told me about John D. Yeah, they don't mention him. Before we get yeah. far off the subject, I, I wanted to ask Jim, uh, did you ever uh, read Falconelli's um, Dwellings of the Philosophers and kind of tie things together with him? Because it sounds like you guys are coming from really similar foundational work. Um, I haven't, no, I have not familiar with Falconelli, no, but I know the name, but I'm not familiar, I haven't read so the work. So the reason I bring it up is because... Um, they, they have such a thing as called the angel language, and I'm not talking about the magical language of, uh, of John Dee. They, they also call it the language of the birds, and they think that, um, that there's uh, one universal language that all languages stem from. And Falconelli is uh, explaining how they used symbolism because of the Greek root. If I remember correctly, there's a Greek root. I mean, I know that it's it's somewhat debated, but that there's a Greek root to French, and so that the, the if you read the Falconelli book, he describes how an illustration or a picture will be decoded directly into letters and numbers, and with enough um, symbols there that it's obvious that it's a very specific scene. And it reminded me a lot of your work, especially you talking about the Latin part of it, that 
when you're translating, it becomes really obvious that, like you said, D's talking to you because it snaps and you're like, aha, I get it. And then you find right. it redundantly again and again. You So you're un, unraveling the riddle over and over again. And Falconelli's book, the, the, main, the book I'm talking about is called The Dwellings of the Philosophers. And he's describing alchemy and how they've hidden the symbols of the angel language or the language of the birds and how they've used it as a way to encode, protect, and keep themselves safe. And at the same time, it's, you know, a way to keep it inside the secret college or in inside the secret society so that they can trade back and forth in letters and or pictures. And even if someone finds it, it doesn't mean anything because you don't understand the secret code, you know. Exactly, yeah. Being writing cryptic. Yeah, Adi uh, was fluent in uh, Greek, Latin, and, uh, and some Hebrew. And, uh, and also French and Italian and such. So, I mean, he was just such a polymath. And a lot of his clues are hidden in the letters of the Greek alphabet and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Latin alphabet. He's particularly uh, uh, fond of the, in fact, uh, I'll show you one of them. <laughs> Since you, uh, <clears throat> the Greek, al the Latin alphabet has, uh, has the 23 uh, letters in it. And uh, so the middle letter is M, um, but, <clears throat> Guess what letter? Uh, the number nine. When we talked about the number nine, it's very important. I mean, I didn't get into the whole nine, but you noticed how 108 and 252 were all, uh, you know, add up to nine. The whole thing. Well, guess what the ninth letter is? I. <laughs> so there you so go. So he makes a whole riddle about the about the ninth, and and Bucky says uh, in the Bucky uh, in the in the cube octahedron uh, there are eight tetrahedra, and the center point is the no nine. It's the place where everything passes through. And so that's the eye of uh, the eye is the center point of the whole shape. So, yeah. uh, that, and that is the model for the for the uh, for the for the camera obscura. So, so the whole thing is one big riddle, and and uh, D uh, does involve uh, language and uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and especially the alphabet letters, the numbers of the alphabet. He, he even says in his book that he uses gametria and zero and uh, and notericon. And these are, uh, uh, Gematria is number codes. Uh, zero is a jumbled letter code where you, you, you mix letters up like the jumble in the newspaper. Right. And, and Notericon is where you take the first letter of a phrase and it spells another word. And he says that he's using them. Well, nobody ever looks for them. Well, I look for them. I'm like, oh, look what he's doing here. So, <laughs> yeah, there are all of these, you know, under hidden lever, level clues that you, you have to figure out. Right. But they're all there. He, he, he tells us everything. Yeah, that you're you're talking about the nine reminded me of my email question whether or not uh, Bucky and D might have been thinking of nine intervals. But uh, I don't know if we could, you know, the question I asked folks in email uh, yesterday or this afternoon I don't remember was um, that Buckminster Fuller thought of nine as being uh well what i misspoke and said was the answer to everything and uh that that's actually true about john d with the number 10 that he sees 10 as the as the beginning or the birth or the 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 coming back to one because it's the repeating number whereas um jim had explained to me that he thought bucky thought of nine more as like null or zero yeah, and so zero. Hmm. right yeah <laughs> Interesting for you astrologers out there, uh, Buckminster uh, Fuller and John D were born within a day of each other. Wow! I mean, huh. They're both uh, per, uh, uh, cancer the crab, cancer the crab. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> wow! I was shocked. I saw this list of you know birthdays of mathematicians, and D was right next to Bucky. I'm like, you're kidding me! I don't know if there's something to that <laughs> yeah, at all. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, in June. <laughs> so you've been My, you've been following. Sorry. My birthday is December 22nd, ah. so, so that's why I'm interested in this stuff. You, you've been following the uh, movements of, of the sun with your um, the thing on the floor yep. for a the while cameras. here? Yeah. Do you, do you do it every day? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, it's like a giant clock for me. I mean, it doesn't work when it's cloudy, but, uh, you know, I had one in my photography studio. I've, been, I've had a camera obscura in my in my studio or office for the last 20 or 30 years yeah not just i mean to see the image it's what goes on outside but also you know to show people and to, to follow uh, the, the pattern of the, the movements of the sun the moon and the stars yeah and uh, uh 
there's another very special <clears throat> aspect of uh, the camera obscura solar disc calendar room. Uh, it's called the analemma, and, and if you uh, look on the back of a globe from the 1950s or 60s, that figure eight that you see in the back, it's called the equation of time. Well, it's the difference between where the sun is uh, every day where, uh, at its highest zenith versus where the sun is at exactly noon if you look at your clock. So if you, every day you draw a picture on the ground where the sun is at, at 12 noon every day where at your clock time, you'll see that it, may, it over the year will make this figure eight shape. And so that's another uh, aspect of astronomy that, that Dee was into. I've heard of that before, yeah. Okay, yeah. so now, have you, I assume, but tell me if, uh, if this assumption is incorrect, has it been, as, you know, as predicted this entire time? In other words, have there been any deviations to your observation in- Oh, you mean the alignments in the tower? In the in this what you're seeing about the sun and the moon. Oh, the sun and the moon. No, no, they're regular. These are patterns that uh, the 18.6 year cycle uh, was known to the uh, to the Greeks, and uh, D. Ian certainly would have known about it. And uh, the pattern of the sun uh, that's so regular every every year uh, at exactly nine o'clock, this uh, the light shines through and illuminates this uh, the egg egg uh, rock that I showed you in there. Uh, no, nothing's changed. Nothing's okay. changed. <laughs> uh, well, it's, uh, I asked just because that I, I've often wondered how many people are actually, you know, tracking oh, I'm checking these on things, things and making sure that every, everything's on the up and up, you know, with the I'm checking on things. No, we, right, we do go through these, this cycle of 29,000 year cycle where we go through different signs of the zodiac. You know, we just went from, from Pisces and, and we we're heading into the age of Aquarius. Nobody knows exactly where it's going, it's going to start, but that's what they were celebrating in the 1960s in San Francisco, the, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And this is to be an age that will bring in all sorts of new information. And this, you and me, we're just the beginning of it. So. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a, 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 a just a, a wonderful time to have. I'm I'm an optimist. I'm not, you know. And so, uh, and we're leaving the age of Pisces. It's a very uh, it's a very transitional thing. And I think Dee knew this too because these periods last every uh, two thousand years. And uh, you know, the last change was when Jesus came. Before that, it was Taurus, the age of Taurus. And now we're going at the age of uh, we went into the age of Pisces. That's why they call Jesus the fish. And now we're working our way out into the age of Aquarius. They don't know exactly when it's going to start, uh, but uh, I think it just started tonight. <laughs> <laughs> here, here. We did, we did get a question earlier in the chat, um, Jim, asking what you thought. Um, well, the question specifically was what you thought these technologies mean and maybe what they mean uh, in relation to something like spirituality or God. And I think that when he mentioned technologies, he was... You know, I correct me, a cult fan was the one who asked in the chat, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what he means is you're kind of discovering, um, we would call sigil magic and the use of symbols, you know, we would probably consider that just as a technology. And so I, I think that was the question he was wondering, how you think the, what, is, what does it mean to discover these things and maybe how might it relate to people's spirituality? Wow, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, people know that there's power in, uh, in in symbols. That's what you know. Corporate logos are all about. Yep. And brand and all of this stuff. And and D saw that too. His Mona symbol, he saw that as a very powerful thing. And and that's why he said it had to be specifically the proportions that he that he said. So, uh, you know, um, how you harness that power or how you even uh, uh, can calculate it. Uh, it, it's something that I think only a human mind can really assess, but, you know, we'll, we'll find more of that stuff uh, as, as time goes on. And, uh, you know, we still have these symbols today, the peace symbol and, and, and the stop sign and, and, and all of these uh, symbols. Yeah, it's the whole idea of symbology, but that's what Dee was into. And, uh, and, and, and uh, the whole, all the uh, alchemical symbols for all of the planets and, and, and such, there was... There's a very famous book by uh, uh, Henry Cornelius Agrippa called uh, The Three Books of, uh, on the Occult. And that came out when, uh, just when Dee was uh, maybe 20 or 30 years old. And he owned a copy of it. And, 
it's uh, it's a really thick book, but explains uh, the ancient symbolisms and the history of symbols uh, and uh, and alphabet letters and all of this coding stuff. It's it's very powerful stuff, and I think people will will see that there's uh, there's more to it in the future that than uh, than than meets the eye. You know, nowadays we don't really see it. <laughs> Right, and so we're, I'm getting I'm getting one more question here in a similar vein. Um, someone asks, uh, "What you think of Jason Louv's John D. scholarship?" Now I don't know for sure that you're familiar with that, but the the Os, yeah. Oswald oh, yeah. Spengler in the chat is uh, is is curious what you think of of Louv's scholarship. So it looks like he's probably got the book right there, folks. Here he goes ducking off the screen again. <laughs> so there you go. All right. Yeah, Jason, this book just came out, Jason Lowe, and uh, it's called John D. and the Empire of the Angels, Enochian Magic and the Occult Roots of the Modern World. And he says a lot of the same things that I'm saying about how John D. Uh, w w it was responsible for the founding of America and uh, the reason why we speak English today. And it was uh, through his efforts that he was the spark of the whole thing. Now, uh, Lowe, he... Uh, he, uh, he's a little more on the magical side than I am, you know, uh, and uh, I expect someday that he'll show up at the tower and be interested in all of my stuff, and, and the whole thing will sort of merge. But Yeah, uh, mes message him. Everybody in the chat, message him. Message this guy and tell him he needs to get down here and see Jim Egan. That, you know, we can, we can blast him with some emails and maybe tag him on Twitter or something and let him know that he's missing a chunk. Yeah, that's a very important, you know, integrates with, with what I do. He gets into more into the magical stuff. Uh, as I mentioned, this kind of, uh, when you read uh, the books on John D, and there's, uh, there's one called The Queen's Conjurer by uh, Woolley, W-O-L-E-Y. That's the best uh, basic uh, biography of John D. And they'll all tell you that this is a pre-1583 John D, and then the after-1583 John D. And so, uh, you know, Jason deals a lot more with the after uh, 1583 John D, and, and I deal a little bit more with the before, but it's the same guy, and he's the same, you know, person. He did go through kind of some big transformations when Edward Kelly came into his life, but, uh, but it's the same guy, and it's sort of the same story, and, you know, he's got missing pieces of the puzzles that I'm missing, and, you know, so it, it's a great thing. I don't know when we cut out before, but I spoke a little bit about Kelly. Did you hear that part? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you're welcome to go back over it. I mean, we've still got plenty of time, and um, so if you're, if you're. Uh... Well, no, just the part about because I don't know what time I cut out because all of a sudden I was talking and it was black. But did I did I explain about his diary, John D's diary, and the four feet underneath the ground? No, I don't think so. Please no. go ahead. Oh wow! He cut out again. Oh no! Did we lose oh, no. him? No, right no, there? I'm still here. Oh, okay, good, good. So, just very briefly, <clears throat> you know, just before John D. left for Europe for eight years, Kelly comes knocking on his door, and he says, I know how to read a crystal ball, and I can talk to the angels for you. So D. hires them, and they hold seances as they go across Europe. Well, D. says... I never saw any of the angels. Uh, he only says he saw the angels once, uh, and, and that was by the west window. But anyway, uh, uh, D uh, uh, and uh, and Kelly, through Kelly, they talked to uh, Ariel and Uriel and and uh, and, and Raphael. And uh, D says, I never saw anybody, but I believe Kelly. And he wrote down everything that happened in his diary. And uh, here, Edward Kelly. Now he taketh the white garment and put it on. And words and all of this uh, Enochian language and all of these uh, alphabets and letters and all of this huge diary. Well, when he died in fifteen in sixteen oh uh, nine, he buried his uh, diary in a in a wooden box four feet underneath the ground. Well, an antiquarian bought his uh, bought his house in, in, in fifty years later and uh, dug up the book. And, and they published it, uh, what happened, a true and faithful relation, what happened for many years between uh, jo John D. and some spirits in 1659. But now, we didn't talk to spirits anymore. We were in the scientific revolution. We were Puritans. This was all considered craziness. And they're, they're making fun of John D. They're not saying this is good stuff. They're saying, look what this crazy guy was all about. And, and so John D. has ever, been, ever since been thought of as the magician. And all of his statesmanship, all of his 
mathematics, all of this geometry, thrown out the window. You know that when we use the colon today for proportions in mathematics, John Dee was the first guy to use the colons, the two dots for proportions. Yeah, wow. And, and he, yeah, and he was just brilliant, and, uh, and and he was the foremost geometer, the navigational guide to all Elizabethan explorers, and, and he invented these, you know, these tools, and, and he wrote books on astronomy, and he wrote 40 books, the textbooks, and so uh, he was just sort of brilliant, but because he talked to the angels, Nobody wants to study him anymore. So yeah, that's, that's all changing again, though. You're seeing a, a maybe people who only follow mainstream stuff aren't seeing it. But if you're a person who really trolls around on the internet and reads a lot of different uh, uh, subjects, and um, you're seeing a huge resurgence in like a renaissance reawakening of magical thinking, magical practice. You're seeing Gnostics and pagans and people practicing uh, John Dee's Enochian magic and other types of magic. So. I think that ties into the whole age of Aquarius thing, you know, that there's something, the water's being poured back out onto the earth. Something's happening. We're having a, the very, I think you're right. We're right at the very beginning of waking up to a, to not, not thinking of the world as only being material and, and uh, quantifiable that we can't, we can no longer dismiss things just because we can't quantify them. There's lots of things that, uh, that the, I'd say the things that we enjoy the most in life aren't quantifiable. Love isn't something quantifiable. Friendship isn't quantifiable. Lots of things don't fall into the category of being counted or measured. And we're right. seeing people coming back to that right now in the world. And I, I look forward to it. No, I totally agree. Yeah, and I think the Internet is, is partially responsible for it because people are now communicating and cross fertilizing and such so right yeah, it's exciting times it's exciting we're just at the very birth of it you know they'll laugh at the, what we call the internet now in another 50 years and and uh, uh it, it's just going to be yeah it's you know there's a lot coming so we're laying foundations and someday 50 years from now they'll find the tape of this tonight and they'll say hey, look what those guys were doing <laughs> exactly that's that's the plan right like hey we, we're out here and we're trying to let people know and um, yeah. I, 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 I want to make sure that you know that you are certainly welcome to, to come back and be a guest here anytime. Um, I'm going to definitely keep your email handy and or uh, your cell phone, and I might send you things now and then. But uh, I want to encourage you to go back to one of our past shows. It's called, um, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but the episode is called The Walmart of Esoteric uh, Cosmology. And uh, yeah. there, so that's a gentleman that we're, uh, he's given us a slideshow and like an overview of all of the most basic occult subjects. And um, the reason that we know about him is because Tracy found him somehow and he had uh, documented, uh, he translated a document called The Secret, T tell us the name of that document, Tracy, please. It was uh, Secret Statutes of the Templars. Right. And he's also very uh, good with the, the Latin. So I think... I think you would enjoy that episode in general, but I also think that you and Harrison is his name. Um, probably uh, there's a chance you guys could get along because you're both uh, you both <laughs> experts at, at dead languages. So. Oh, good. Oh, oh, thanks. I will check that out for sure. Yeah. No, I'm learning new things every day and and, uh, and seeing new connections. So. Okay. <laughs> and it looks like it was episode 39 was the was the number for that one. It, I will check it out. So, yeah, yeah, I'll check it out. Yeah. Jim, next time you uh, you come on, I'm going to dress up as Lady Occasion, okay? So. Oh, do. I'd love to see that costume. I, Maybe I think, I'll just dress up as John D. Yeah, planning for a <laughs> costume show, that is in the books. We will get together um, either in email or text, and we can all make a plan for uh, for costuming up for a show. I love this idea. So. Nice. Hey, uh, <laughs> tell, tell us about her forelock, because that's what I noticed about her, and you and you mentioned it in in one of the things you wrote. You said that she's got this this piece of hair that's kind of uh, hanging down there, and uh, and you're supposed to grab it and 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 do something with it, right? Yeah. If you grab a lock of her hair, then that's that's where the good fortune comes, and that you'll see that she's got the lock of hair hanging out here, and the queen is reaching out. For the crown of victory, she's holding this crown. Uh, if you can see it there, it's like a uh, like a Roman uh, crown. And so, uh, Dee is saying, you know, 
seize the opportunity, all this good stuff will happen. And so, yeah, that's a very old metaphor, you know, but of all things, she's standing, as I said, on the tetrahedron. These are all clues. Oh, by the way, <laughs> Verrazano, when he came here in 1525, he uh, said that triangular island out on the, uh, uh, in the bay, uh, what he calls it a triangular island. He says it's about the size of the Isle of Rhodes. Wow. And that's where we get the name Rhode Island. D picked up on it. And he says, oh, Rhode, that means Rose, which is the Tudor Rose. But it also means the Island of Rhodes. Well, I went to Rhodes. And sure enough, it looks exactly like, not exactly like that island, but has the same cliffs on the front. When you sail around it, it looks like this lonely island. He named it after the, the queen. He called it Claudia. But when you go to Rome, when you go to, uh, to, uh, to uh, this beautiful city of Rhodes, on the island of Rhodes, that's exactly what the towers look like, the entrance towers to the city. It's a huge ancient Templar city where they built these huge, uh, you know, balustrades on. So that is another clue that's in this in this thing about roads. D was just so thorough. There's like 20 clues in there. Anyway, so, <laughs> yeah, that's, that was my that's, father. My father's deceased, but that was his last name was Rhodes. Well, Ro there you go. Well, that means Rose. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a beautiful thing. So that's interesting. <laughs> he was, so, was he a Rhodes Scholar? You must be the Rhodes Scholar. He, he, didn't you say he was related to S Cecil? You know, that's my curiosity, and I'm I'm actually um I'm getting ready to mail uh, some material to my relative who's the most um, obsessed with genealogy, and I mean she is like she is obsessed in it. It's in a good way. It's healthy, but she is she's the kind of person that you end up having to pay two hundred and fifty dollars an hour to help you. But I'm going to send her some material. When I went to Scotland, I actually went and did some genealog genealogical research at the Scottish Genealogy Society. And it's probably been three years now, and I haven't mailed her the stuff that I brought back. I'm sure she, if, I was, if I was in her face, she'd probably give me a kiss on the cheek and a slap on the other one for waiting so long to get her the stuff. <laughs> but um, when I do... I'd be curious to know if the family name comes from the island. Yeah, me too. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give her um, some some extra incentive, let's say, in the package to maybe go ahead and dig in deeper. I might even go do one of the DNA tests, but I really don't like those things because I don't like the information that they're putting out about them not really being respectful of the DNA. But I might just say screw it and do it anyway. But <laughs> do you think they're accurate? I don't. I, I well, I think I think they are, but I think that there's. There's, for some reason, there's politics involved there. I've seen more than one article of them um, claiming that they've intentionally fudged some numbers, that they're sharing data, even though people have agreed to, that they don't want it shared. So, you know, if you look up kind of a controversial tinge on the, you know, if you're searching for it, if you look for controversial subjects about the DNA companies, there's definitely some bad press. And so it makes me tentative, but... I might still just do it anyway, just to, because I know a bunch of our family members have done it. They're all on Ancestry.com, and uh, I didn't really know my father's side of the family very well, so maybe it's time to finally start uh, taking a closer look and see where the rose unfolds. <laughs> yeah, see where it happens. All it takes is a C note and some spit. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I wanted to also point out that um, people in the Discord server had recommended that uh, it was Krista, I think, or is, uh, who, she's usually in the chat, she's not here tonight, but um, she's the one that recommended that maybe we crowdfund a trip, and it, it might take us six months or a year, but if, if people are interested to see us take a cross-the-country road trip to go meet the uh, Jim Egan and see the tower in real life and to to digress this whole thing into an even bigger ball of wax. I'm certainly willing. I don't know if Jim and Tracy uh, could make the time and the effort to do it, but I think it would be great. I think it would be a, a wonderful adventure and a journey to plan farther in the future to to get over there and check. I want to I want to put my hands on the rocks. So you think if we go at night, we can jump that little black fence and walk around in there without too much trouble, Jim? Well, I, I, I know the guy with the key. I mean, uh, it, you know, it's owned by the city, and so I, you'd have to get permission, but we could maybe get some permission for you if you wanted to go inside and see it. Yeah. So you can pretty much see everything from outside. I really go, rarely go with it myself, but uh, I've, been, uh, I've measured it before and had permission to do it. They're very nice about it. They have, uh, last year, they had a wedding there in, inside, and, uh, and so uh, 
uh, you know, we get uh, we get permission on it. And uh, when uh, you know America on Earth came, they got permission and they were able to go in there. And it's beautiful from inside. You really get a feel for it. But um, but yeah. Oh, oh one more thing. Tour. The the tower. Yeah. Um, have you ever had someone compare the uh, effects of the sun on the uh, pyramid of Chichen Itza? in mexico to the because uh, it's the same days on the equinox in mexico or the solstice pardon me uh the sun hits the the pyramid of chichen itza just right that it makes the shadow illusion of a snake coming down the side of the pyramid and they have uh well their god is like a combination snake jaguar um bird i think it's a bird snake jaguar is the the mayan god and if you've never uh, contrasted those two things, Jim, you should definitely take a look because it's the same date for at least some of the astrological phenomenon. So. No, it's a good point. I'd like, uh, you know, I, I like to tell people that all cultures were have been interested in archaeoastronomy. Uh, you know, in the cathedrals in Europe, you'll see uh, astronomical alignments. Uh, the Arabs were into it. Uh, you know, the American Native American Indians, and like you say, Mexico, the Aztecs, all of these guys, except one. Stupidos Americanos. Why? We got cell phones, we got watches. What the hell do we need that for? What a stupid thing. What a stupid thing. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I was going to say that it seems to me like you might be, uh, you might be the, local, um, the local Jesus character there in your town because, uh, you know, a prophet can't be heard. In, uh, I, I know it's not your hometown, but that's where you live, right. and so right. that you know, the, nobody from Rhode Island or the the New England really cares. It's all of us other weirdos out here in the world that are fascinated by uh, esoteric stuff. But hopefully that'll right. change and people will start showing up. Yeah, no, you got to be on the wavelength. And the other thing is that the tower is hidden in plain sight. It's right in the middle of this city, so everyone's like, "Well, shit, if you know, it was that important, other people would have figured it out by now." I mean, you know, if it was out in the middle of the forest someplace and archaeologists looked at it, you know, that's one thing. But here it's in the middle of the city, and they're like, well, we must know. It's been there the whole time. Right. But nobody knows. Right. Nobody studies it. How do I know that? I've been here for the last eight years. I've been begging people just to come down. I've been to the local universities, the historical societies, all these, inviting them all down. The, 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 the state architect, archaeologists, I'm like... They just everybody's got a different reason. They're not interested. So, well, to find you know bright people like you, you are a, a shining light. That's why I stay up to twelve thirty at night. It's twelve thirty at night here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we yeah, appreciate it. We really That's appreciate okay. it. <laughs> so you said you said people show up on these special dates to watch the astrological al alignments. Yeah, yeah astrological alignments. Group? Yeah, <clears throat> the. Uh, uh, on the uh, on the solstice, particularly, uh, people show up. Uh, the the uh, solstice means uh, sun stands still, solstice, and so the, the sun stays in that position for several days. So you can observe it about you know a week before and a week after. And so what you really want to do is uh, watch the weather, and you want to come here on a day that it's sunny morning. Because if you come here at seven o'clock in the morning and this and, and there's clouds on the eastern horizon or it's a cloudy sky. You ain't going to see nothing, but uh, so uh, sometimes, but people always show on the solstice because they got it marked on the calendar and they're like, oh, this is the day. So it's fortunately, nice last solstice, it was sunny and, uh, and it worked out fine. And, uh, 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 but there are also, uh, uh, we get a lot of Masons that come because the local Masons people, and I've told them they, they're all, they're more on the Templar side than they are on my side, but they'll listen to me and such. And so, uh, and Scotty Walter, he shows up every, every year. Uh, and uh, there's another guy by the name of Dave Brody, who's a friend of mine, who writes uh, fiction books about the tower and includes these astronomical alignments. And so, so they all show up, and we have a great time. We're all friends because we're we have this common interest in the tower, you know. And uh, and so uh, even though we all have different points of view, and you know, they'll come and they'll make fun of me, and I'll make fun of them, and then we just have a good time. We'll go out to, to breakfast together, but. Uh, uh, there's also uh, <clears throat> alignments that happen on the equinox, not as many people come, and uh, that other lunar alignment, 18.6 years, and there's also a north star alignment that actually does not work anymore uh, because of uh, uh, the procession of the equinox that, that you had talked about, that, that doesn't, but uh, that aligns with the north star. So, And we've discovered a couple of new alignments as well, <clears throat> and uh, 
uh, there are a couple of researchers that are studying it. There's one guy that hires me to go out and uh, do uh, time-lapse photography of the, of the tower at, at different uh, times uh, because he's studying the, the movement of the sun uh, through various windows as well. So, but Penhollow did most of the work on it, and, uh, and he was such a brilliant astronomer. He taught astronomy and physics at the University of Rhode Island for 30 years. He studied at Brown under Otto Neuschbauer, who discovered uh, Babylonian astronomy. The guy is just brilliant, uh, but nobody sort of listens to him either because he's kind of like in his own kind of, he's above everybody. I can't even understand everything that he understood. But, uh, but he did, you know, write this incredible article. And uh, by looking at the article, I said, well, let's see if this works. I'm a photographer. If this works, I should be able to take pictures of it. And damn, everything he said was right. So... That just blew me away. That's why I got so excited about it. Sold my photography business, sold my studio, sold my house, and moved down to Newport and started this uh, museum. Yeah, right? that's, what a leap of faith you took, Jim, to do that. You know, that shows dedication above. I mean, that's to me, that's a righteous zealotry. You know, usually the word zealot is uh, it's, it comes with a negative tinge because of the reputation of religions. But I'd say what you're doing is a righteous zealotry to actually be so dedicated that you uh, that you follow, you know, to to the ends of the earth. Like, yep, yeah, I'm doing this, and so I think that's the important that's story, great. and it's my dharma. I don't know if you know what dharma means, but it's yeah, good. that's the that's the deal. So, uh, but. Uh, but it didn't come to me, uh, but, you know, it, it's sort of an accumulation of my life's work, uh, what I've been interested in, and, um, and it's just a, a very special story. <laughs> Someday you'll get it. That's why I'm so gr grateful to people like you that, well, you know, will listen to me for two and a half hours, blab about all of this stuff, because, uh, you know, <laughs> most people think, uh, you know, from, from the, from the get-go that there's a little craziness at this astronomical alignments in a building in the middle of Newport? What, are you kidding me? So, anyway, so, I get a lot of cynicism. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, to me, that's a dead giveaway that it's not a windmill. <laughs> yeah, hello, yeah. I mean, that in the windows, I, I saw in your other video, you pointed that out, and I thought that was kind of funny. Like, so this windmill is, uh, A, it's built out of stone, which is like, that's just crazy. B, yeah. it's full of windows, and right. and, and C, a fireplace. yeah, it's got a fireplace in it, and uh, and and don't forget that uh, you know if you come at the equinox and other um, high points on the calendar, then everything lines up just perfect, just like a pyramid, just like so many other phenomenon that are uh, tied to megaliths and other ancient structures. So, yeah, I, it's funny to yeah. me how people don't want to accept change, and so they they say silly things like, "Oh, we think it was a windmill," or, right. "Oh, we we we're, we're happy with the mystery." Come on, that solving this mystery that you're doing, Jim, is ten million times more exciting and interesting, and opens up that many more leads for people if they really love mysteries and they weren't just talking shit, then they would follow your work. Because this is all mysteries. It's one uh, onion skin underneath another. All Turtles all the way down, you know. <laughs> you get it. Yeah, turtles all the way down. Yeah, yeah. Did you, no, did I mean, you explain I, I, the, uh, the, the fire in the fireplace thing? Oh, no, yeah, let's do that. If you, don't, if you still, if you've got a little bit more gumption in you, um, that, that part, I remember, that's, that's interesting. The fire in the fireplace. Fire, fire, water stuff. Yeah, oh, the fiery water thing. Yeah, the oh, elemental, yeah, the elemental Did part of it. In my book, I remember you mentioning it in, in one of your books and in your video, one of your videos. The, oh, the, the 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 sun makes it look like there's fire in there. And on the equinox, <clears throat> the equinox at the at the setting sun, the sun sets almost coming through the west window sets almost in the middle of the fireplace. Uh, but it doesn't. It, it, in other words, I photographed it, and you'll see there's this box of light coming through the west window, works its way up. It's a square box, and about a half hour before sunset, it's directly underneath the, the fireplace. <clears throat> well, the houses that have been built block it, so you don't really get the full sunset, but it would end up on the right-hand side. And Professor Penhollow and I, we couldn't figure out why they didn't put it in the middle of the fireplace. Well... <clears throat> I couldn't build a camera obscura in the tower because the tower is, uh, it doesn't have a roof or a floor bar and you need a perfectly dark room. So <clears throat> my photography assistant and I went down 
to this firehouse, which is just down the street, that had a view out one of the windows that the, that the tower once had, the west window. And we set up a nine uh, foot seamless paper. And uh, there is the image, the camera obscure image of what's happening, that the image is coming through this hole uh, uh, overlooking the bay. So here's the water right here. This is a, America's Cup Avenue, Mill Street. There's the sky, and there's the bridge, the Newport Bridge, and here is the sun. So everything's upside down. <clears throat> in other words, it makes more sense. It looks like a regular scene this way. You seen that okay? Uh-huh. It's a little okay. bit of a reflection, but it's, okay. it's working. Oh, right. You get the idea. Well, <clears throat> this is the image of the sun here, but this is called fiery water. I call it fiery water. It's the reflection of the light off the water in oh, the late afternoon. We, we lost you there, Jim. Hold on. There we go. All right. There, now you're back. I'm low battery, but it's the light on the water in the, in the late afternoon. And, and, and uh, a very famous physicist by the name of Robert Boyle, he writes about it. In a dark room, I use a convex lens to project the image of a river shined on by the sun. It looks like millions of shiny fish scales. And so, uh, and so in my photography studio, uh, I uh, set up a camera obscura, and I followed where the sun was. Every day, I would mark off uh, with a circle uh, around the sun with a pencil. And every minute, I would draw a circle, so I had the path that it took. This is just before sunset in, the, in, this, in my photography studio. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and then it moved. The next day it was over here, and it would move every day. So uh, I had a camera obscure at, at, on, in the summer. It would, it would set here, and in the, in the spring and fall, in the equinoxes, it would set here, and here it would set in the winter. So I made a camera obscure, a solar disk at sunset calendar room in my photography studio, and then I transferred that data into the interior of the tower and found out exactly as we said on the equinox, the middle of the year, the sun sets on the right-hand side of the fireplace. That's if the west window was all blocked up, you'd see just the solar disk, the image of the sun, which is a, about a two and one eighth inch diameter uh, disk. Well, I pieced all of this stuff together, and here's what I found out: on that day, the equinox, the setting sun would set right up here, but a half an hour before, the image of the sun would be right underneath the fireplace. Well, that means that the fiery water display would be right in the fireplace. And so on that day, not only you'd have the solar disk underneath the fireplace and the sun, the uh, fiery water, you could also start a fire. And this is, happens on uh, the first of Aries. And you know what kind of sign Aries is? It's, it's the first sign. of the fire sign. Yeah. <laughs> and oh. you know what's just before it? Pisces. Right. And you know what kind of sign, sign Pisces is? It's water. The water sign. When you go from water to fire, you get fiery water in the fireplace. Who the hell would have figured that been so brilliant to do something like that? Well, John D. would. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's a very important uh, thing. Uh, you see, the first of Aries is uh, March 21st. Yeah, the ancients felt that the Earth was created on March 21st, the beginning of spring when things start anew every year. So it's a very important, and, and in, uh, in his... Uh, in his uh, uh, Mona symbol, of course, the bottom part of it is the Aries symbol. Here he has the one zodiac, because it's the first of the 12 zodiacal signs. And so, uh, and in one of his books that I talked about earlier, uh, he even writes about it. He says, in, uh, in this Propodumata Aphoristica, he says, Observe and contemplate the wonders of the many fracturings of the heavenly rays in the air, clouds, and water. And you'll be impelled to praise the infinite wisdom and goodness of God. Well, the heavenly rays on the water, there's a guy talking about fiery water right there. And there it is in his symbol. So there are all of these things that kind of fit together. And uh, that's just another one of the incredible alignments that, that, he, that I came up with. I'm glad you mentioned that because not many people, it's kind of an extensive thing. But No, uh, thank you, Tracy. Yeah, because that was, uh, and that you said that happens on the equinox. And yeah, both the fall and the spring equinox. Yeah. The, the, the spring equinox, the sun will set uh, on the right-hand side. And so, uh, but you can't duplicate it today because they, the houses that are built around the park, they block the actual sunset. You can only see about a half an hour before. But I pieced it all together and how this all worked right. with all the purposes of it. And then I asked Professor Penhollow, and he, uh, you know, he saw that the, the, the whole thing worked that way. So, uh, <laughs> and, and then uh, uh, the, the connecting thread in this, if you got another minute. 
Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Is that uh, the first governor of Rhode Island, he knew about all of this. He knew all of these alignments. He knew the whole thing. And how do I know that? Well, <clears throat> and I found in this old book that his chair that he got when he was governor of Rhode Island still existed. And it's over at the Redwood Library, this beautiful library around the corner, one of the oldest libraries in America. And uh, when they fixed it, in the, it was missing the back and the top, but it was, had these side pieces, and they put this, uh, this uh, top piece on as a flat piece. Well, I said to them, I said, that's not a very good repair job. This should have been a wainscot chair, much fancier. Uh, this is a style chair. You can tell from the bottom that this was a wainscot chair. And so, you know what I did? I built my own. So this is my replica of the first governor's chair of Rhode Island. I don't know if you can see the whole thing here, uh, but uh, it, it, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's made out of wood. I, I, I cannibalized a couple other chairs, and this is my design. But on the design are these three circles, one, two, three, and then a, a line. And you can see that they were made with a geometer's compass because you can see the, the pinhole in it. Well, here is the original. Uh, this is a one-to-one -one, uh, photograph of the original on the, uh, uh, on the chair that's in the Redwood Library. And so I studied this design in, in geometrically and in uh, Illustrator, Photoshop, uh, that I work in. And I found out that uh, the circles, the center of the circles, uh, make a 30, 60, 90 triangle, which is one, two, square root of three. But I also saw that this line and this line and this line make a B shape. And this line and this line make an A shape. Benedict Arnold, he hid his initials in the shape itself. <laughs> so I knew it was his shape. And, and who else would carve into the governor's chair this incredible design? But the third thing I realized was that the diameter of each one of these circles is three is two and one eighth inches in diameter. Well, in a camera obscura, the size of the solar disk, the image of the sun, varies depending on the distance between the the hole in the window and the floor. Now, in my camera obscura here, uh, it's about uh, an inch and a half or so in diameter, the image of the sun. But in these cathedrals in, in Europe, it's about a foot and a half, and this solar disk will move across the floor very slowly. Well, in a camera obscura that's exactly uh, 18 and a half feet of diameter, which is the diameter of the interior of the tower, the image of the sun, the solar disk, is exactly two and one eighth inches in diameter, the exact <laughs> same size that's on there and it's on there. And so how did I know all of this? Well, in my photography studio, I set up the exact same size, and I drew about a thousand of these two and one-eighth inches diameter circles over the course of uh, several years. And so once I saw that he had the same size circle, I'm like, this guy knew. This guy <laughs> yeah. knew what was going on in there. But he was a merchant, and he was a colonial, uh, you know, governor. He was governor for, uh, for eight terms. Look. Benedict Arnold, Benedict Arnold, Benedict Arnold, Benedict Arnold for eight terms, and he took. But and so, but he wasn't smart. Then, as I was studying all this, I came across the John D. Bay and River, and I'm like, John D. Now there's a guy that would have figured out this astronomy. This is too sophisticated for uh, a colonial settler. And even though D. lived before this guy, D. lived in the cultural milieu of the European Renaissance. He didn't. You know, grow up. This guy came over here to America when he was 19 years old. He would have had no way to understand all of this astronomy and such. So right. uh, he was a clue to to uh, to, uh, to to leading me to, uh, to to this guy John D. And uh, uh, I want to show you one other thing that kind of culminates all of this stuff. I can find this. Uh, you see, Sir Humphrey Gilbert. He uh, uh, when he uh, when he uh, got his letters patent in. Uh, in uh, 15, 1578, can't find the illustration right now. Well, uh, I'll just tell you about it. Uh, he, uh, he got the letters patent on the summer solstice of that year, exactly on the date of the summer solstice. And he left England on his ships uh, on the summer solstice on June, uh, on the same day, the summer solstice, uh, uh, four or uh, five years later. So these guys did things in accordance to the sun. Well, this guy, Benedict Arnold, when he died, and he wrote his, uh, his will on December uh, 21st, which was his birthday, and, but he wrote a codicil to the will. And, and you know what a codicil is? It's like an amendment. 
sort of an additional thing. Right. Well, the day that he wrote the codicil to the will uh, it, it is, uh, is the summer solstice of 1678, 100 years to the day exactly after Sir Humphrey Gilbert received his letters patent. So he knew about the whole thing, and the last thing he did was to leave me a clue uh, which you can still read on his will, which is up in the John Carter Brown Library. A hundred years to the day. It's unbelievable. That, that is uh, crazy. That he did that. Yeah, it's crazy. I can't find the graphic on it right now, but uh, I, 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 I uh, oh, here it is here. Yeah. And, and so uh, uh, it took some figuring out to do because uh, uh, they were still using the uh, Gregorian, uh, the, the, the Julian calendar back then because they didn't adopt these codes. So uh, he uh, wrote his will on June 10th, uh, 1678, and, and uh, Sir Humphrey Gilbert received his uh, letters patent on June 11th, 1578. Now, you might say, when I first saw it, I'm like, oh, shit, they were off by a day. Well, over the course of that century, the, uh, the Julian calendar was out of sync from the sun by one additional day. They both did it exactly on the summer solstice. Unbelievable. Ten wow. hours confirmed. And so that, to me, I'm like, oh, that's pretty good evidence right there. But it's sort of the tail end of the story. It's like, I can't tell you that until after three hours you listen to me rant and rave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's worth it to get there, though. It's worth but that's it. A great, that's a great culminating clue to me. And, uh, and then also the one that I showed you about the... Uh, about the, uh, the, the, the the necklace and the chain and the, all of this stuff sort of fits together and, and into one giant puzzle and but unless you walk through the door and listen to it you'll never get it's all invisible right that's the, well that's the that's the game that we're in here at, at rx only picture show is taking all of the disparate clues and um just kind of uh being open-minded, um, tying a lot of really uh, seemingly unrelated things together, um, being willing for synchronization and happenstance to play a part, and then um, go back and review your data and kind of pour over it and maybe send a lot of text messages and emails, and then you end up with these aha moments and you end up on the trail of things, and that's just that's what we love to do. Tracy's Correct. one of the yeah. best people I've ever seen do it. If you if you don't follow and read Tracy's work, I highly recommend her stuff. It's 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 very similar to what you're doing. I would say that Tracy probably is the only person I know that's come completely close, if not succeeded, in solving the mystery of the Holy Grail. You know that's. Well, there you go. I want to come. I'll come to Washington to see that. Yeah, that's nice of you to say, Sean. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think Jim's really on a another level here uh, beyond uh, some of the stuff I'm doing. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask you, Jim, one more thing about just what you were just saying. Didn't you have one of your books where you were saying that a lot of the expeditions, the English-led expeditions and um, trips to the New World, the the date on which those uh, those ships departed was chosen to tie in with this uh, the the solstice date that you're talking about. Maybe I, I hope I, I didn't get you mixed up with someone else, but I thought I remembered you saying that in one of your videos. Hello. Oh no. <laughs> oh, he's still there. Oh, but it's frozen. The screen's frozen. We we may have lost him. Because uh -oh. I know he keeps uh, charging up his phone and then bouncing back to us. So, oh man, what a cliffhanger. Yeah. Well, yeah, I wish I had been able to uh, encapsulate it a little bit better than uh, I can barely remember. I think I was actually nodding off when I remember uh, hearing this thing in one of his videos. Because he's got, he's got many, many hours of videos. And you can see how densely packed the material is in this interview that's what all of his stuff is like you know and he, so the the video i was watching the other night where he mentioned this uh you know i i think i was watching it at like two in the morning and uh and that's one of the last details i remember hearing before i fell asleep was uh that yeah all the the dates of english expeditions to the new world were very specifically chosen and i think that that's one of the main themes of one of his books or maybe a, a an essay that he wrote i'm not sure so 
Um, are you, are you, so are you finding all this information on his YouTube channel? He's got a Vimeo channel that's very... Oh, okay. Uh, you know, it's got a lot of stuff there. And then actually, if you, so if you go to NewportTowerMuseum.com, I know that a lot of his material is linked from there. And I think he even has some PDFs of some of these books. You could just read if you so want yeah, to. So yeah, I'm going to throw that in the description to NewportTowerMuseum.com. Yes. Because I've got his and, personal website up in the description, folks. I've got the link to his Amazon. And, of course, all of our other links are there. The Discord's down there. If you want to find it, you can um, join Plus Ultra and, uh, and support Tracy's work. You can toss a few bucks towards me and Jim in the, in the uh, Patreon if you want. But I'm going to make sure that Newport Tower Museum link is up there. Um, I saw Jim uh, disappeared here, so maybe he'll pop back up. Maybe he'll remember that I, I did finally send him the email. I think so, uh, he, oh, so he's, I think he's got another website, and that's I assume that's like for his uh, photography stuff. Yeah, and that's the one I linked. But that. so here, this is better. That's thank you for saying that because I didn't. It seemed funny to me that he was so um, on point with this, but then I found his website, and it was it's just like a, a old fashioned personal page. So this is folks look in the description um, if you're watching this after the fact, or if you want to go right now. New, NewportTowerMuseum.com, and I'm going to drop it in there right now. So, and uh, from my recollection, there's a um, button on there that says resources, and I think that puts you right in. Awesome, that's where we can so find the these videos and videos. PDFs. Yeah, because that's great. I really, um, I'm going to make it on my bucket list. I don't, I don't put a lot of things on my bucket list, but getting over here uh, to to see this thing and. You know, I'm thinking of other things too, like you know, some of the some of the more um, magically inclined people, because uh, Jim Egan is so far out uh, away from that. Not that he's against it, but he's made he's resigned his focus of his work to be the pre-magical Enochian John D. I think um, if he puts his head together with some of these people, like uh, oh. Aaron Leach comes to mind. He's a, he's someone I only found out about recently, but he's uh, he like did the Abermelon ritual successfully and all this stuff. And he's him and his wife, um, they're they're kind of like a magic power couple. But I'm, I mean, he he studies and and writes and works in grimoires specifically. So I think there's a chance that we could we could send some links Jim's way and get a. Uh, you know, get get more synapses firing, getting more spark plugs, uh, kicking off sparks. Cause I think I I know I said this to you before to both of you, Jim and Tracy, that I felt like there was something something special about this. Not just that you know Jim's a little bit got a little bit more clout than our average guest, but that I had like a gut feeling that this is something. And then he announced that this is actually the date. Our show number 42 with him is, is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And I'm thinking, okay, I think I'm, I think my gut feeling is right. You know, oh. maybe, maybe this isn't the, the perfect day, but I think it means something for us to all have that vibe. So it's time to grab lady occasion by the hair. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I got to get a hold of that lock of hair. <laughs> Maybe tapping. We were all wrong with the tapping. We're supposed to be reaching for uh, Lady Luck's uh, curly, curly cue. <laughs> well, um, all so right. anyway, I, is it about time to say okay, bye? I think it is, yeah. I think we're going to have to let it go with that. Um, uh, we He popped in and out and in and out. It's very late. I don't want to keep him any longer anyway. And I will definitely... Uh, correspond with him in email and you do the same and let's see if we can make a plan for a costume party you know so <laughs> okay all right well no. folks we're we're uh i'm tapped out here man my my brain is just swimming with information so um like we do every week we're gonna give you the big wave and the okay bye i'm, okay, gonna, bye. Put, I'm gonna push the button now okay bye